everybody's ready, we'll call the meeting to order. This is the April 3rd meeting of Yellow Springs Village Council. Uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Wintrow. Here. Housh. Here. Sims. Here. McQueen. Here. <coughs> And here. Flag. Thank you. Um, also here is village uh, planner Denise Swinger, uh, village manager Patty Bates. Uh, not present tonight is Melissa Van Zandt, the assistant village manager. Also here is interim chief Carlson. And I'm sorry, here representing Coolidge Wall, Jessica Brockman. Great, thank you. Um, before we uh, get into any council announcements, um, I will um, ask Shanaz reporter to come up and I uh, talk about uh, Green County Combined Health District. Good evening. So Thank you for letting me come here today. Um, I have just a brief presentation. Excuse my wow. neighbor's oh. You brief, Shanaz. <laughs> yes, I can be brief. I'm okay. make this fast. <laughs> so I'll just wait if they pull that up. She's. Thank you, Judy. You are welcome. I should put this Oops. in a little lower. Oops. <laughs> you can move it. Help. Uh oh. What happened there? Mm. Hang on. We're getting there. Looks like there's something missing there. Custom? No. Okay. I think you added a slide. Yeah, I've added a slide, but we'll, we'll be okay. It. We'll skip it. <clears throat> So thank you very much for allowing me to come and speak today. Um, I am Shanaz Reporter. I'm with Green County Public Health. And currently I'm working on a tobacco prevention grant. And we've been approaching um, some different jurisdictions in Green County. And this is about Yellow Springs protecting our children, tobacco-free parks, and public spaces. So tobacco-free policies for municipal parks and recreation areas. Why do this? Well, tobacco-free environments protect the health, safety, and welfare of the community. A village-wide policy creates consistency for youth recreation facilities in the community. Yellow Springs School District prohibits tobacco use and smoking on the campus and at, on their outdoor facilities. Policies for village-owned facilities support local groups such as soccer clubs, t-ball, baseball leagues, disc golf, swim clubs, all who use village facilities and promote healthy lifestyles. So discarded cigarette butts cause litter, which is a violation of our revised code, and require extra maintenance. They increase expense and can be ingested by toddlers. And all of you have probably, probably been around the village and seen that litter um, in various places. Um, children model adult behavior and tobacco-free parks reinforce healthy Lifestyle messages. Small children playing in parks and on recreational grounds are more likely to ingest cigar butt, cigarettes butts, excuse me, if they are discarded and accessible. In 2008, the American Poison Control Center received over 7,000 reports of children under the age of six being poisoned by contact with tobacco-based products. And here's just a list of some of the carcinogenic materials and um, toxic metals and gases in cigarette butts. There's a lot of chemicals in there, and once they're a cigarette butt's tossed in the grass, the rain rains on, I was walking and you'll see a slide. The rain hits it, it gets into the ground, into the soil, and it stays there, so. Um. <clears throat> so according to the Ohio Department of Health, 23.3% of adults in Ohio are current smokers, and the health care costs in Ohio directly caused by smoking have been estimated to be about $5.64 billion annually. Non-smokers who are exposed to secondhand smoke at home, at work, or in other venues increase their heart disease risk by 25 to 30%. And there are options for people who want to quit, and I just put that at the bottom. This is an increasing a topic of uh, increasing momentum around the nation. American Non-Smokers Rights Foundation reports close to 500 municipalities and 100 have 100 percent smoke-free parks, and 100 municipalities have 100 percent smoke-free beaches and other um, locations that grows daily. National Parks Association supports this, and it can be done. It's being done in many locations. So why are these policies effective? They reinforce to the community the message that tobacco use is unhealthy, 
and an unnecessary behavior. It ensures that participants and spectators are not exposed to secondhand smoke while on public grounds, and it creates an environment where leaders can model and promote positive, healthy lifestyle choices. Policies outline the specific outdoor recreational facilities that are covered, so playgrounds, parks, recreation areas that can be written into a policy. It's clear cut, people will know. Currently, um, the Village Park's master plan counts Ellis Pond, Gaunt Park, John Bryan, Hilderon Park, Bill Duncan Park, Fair Acres, Beta Hughes Park, and a parcel on 68 and Allen Street as open spaces, so it's about 50 acres if I'm correct, correct me if I'm wrong. Policies prohibit spectators and participants from using tobacco and smoking devices. So this could be something that could be written into the policy for all of these locations. A policy could describe how facility users will be notified by mailings, policy guidebooks, signage, postings. It could go out on the bill that all parks are going smoke free on a specific date. It could be up posted on the website. Um, different um, options when you sign up for your pool pass or for t-ball, you can get agreements. There are certain activities that can be done with the programs to encourage the smoke free policies. Enforcement, well, people say, how are we going to enforce this? We don't have extra staffing. We don't have extra time. Basically, signage would be the enforcement. Similar to other park poli policies, such as no alcohol, no littering policies, the primary enforcement tool is signage. At least if it's posted, please do not smoke, no smoking, discard your trash, just like any other policy. It's easy to um, get the message out to patrons. Other methods may include policy manual, newsletters, email updates, and website postings. Signed statements from teams, participants, coaches, and parents are other ways to notify facility users. Each department's regulation requirements vary, but some departments ask violators to leave the facility for the remainder of the event, and you can decide that. And for signage, again, best practice would be to include a list of all the facilities covered in your policy have a statement that all forms of tobacco and smoking devices are prohibited and we would like to include, we suggest if you do a policy to include electronic devices. Um, enforcement plan may, excuse me, that includes, includes user notification and signage. So there's, we did make a little mock-up of a sign you can use, but if you decide to embark on a policy such as this, just whatever you create would be fine. We would be happy to work with you on that or we would, we'd be able to produce the sign if you could put the sign up. So we'd be willing to pay for the signage. As long as you don't make something, you know, gold trim and all, just keep the price down. So there are resources on the internet and other um, jurisdictions that have policies implemented. It's easy to find those. We, we also have some samples I can bring on a drive for Judy. There are model policy samples. I have a packet I can bring to you in addition to the material I provided. Also, outdoor signage, I said, again, we could provide that. And posters, pledges for team players, and um, recreational reader guides, too. So one of your staff, which is Samantha Stort, I had a discussion with her, and she stated, at Gaunt Park, staff have to clean up cigarette butts that accumulate over the days. Patrons usually sit on the bench outside the main entrance and smoke and either leave their cigarette butt trash or stick it in the soda can. We have no ash receptacle there. We did put a coffee can out there ourselves, but it's hardly ever utilized. So she had even said that staff spend a lot of time picking up this trash. And sometimes it's not picked up and it's left just to um, disintegrate. And also at the Bryan Center, if you walk around, there's not a lot, but if you notice back near the playground area and near the skate park, that's always been an issue. It would be nice to have a sign there saying, please no smoking. And that would be a way of enforcing. Ellis Pond also, there's some, a few shots here. Beautiful location, but there is cigarette trash also on the grounds. I don't have anything showing Hughes Baby Park, but the train station in Hilderon Park, um, Samantha had mentioned that to me also when I took a look. And, and over the weekend, I walked there last Sunday, and it seemed like the crowd we had on the weekend, Saturday, that was really a wonderful crowd. Mm -hmm. They just littered and littered, and there were like 
there was just things all over the place, cigarette butts all over the place. So at least having some signage there, it may not get through to everyone, but if we can cut it in half, if someone can say, hey, please, that's litter, pick it up, have a receptacle. I noticed there's a receptacle now at the train station, which is wonderful. So moving forward, um, you can review what other jurisdictions have done to support tobacco policy, improving the environment for residents. Kettering has now a tobacco-free policy for their parks. It's on their website, and there's a sample that was in the packet. Consult your legal counsel. They can tell you how to move forward on something like that. <coughs> Design signage. We can supply the signs, as I stated, and if you can install them, that'd be great. Next is just a sample policy from Delaware County. They have many parks that are tobacco-free. It's worked quite well, and they haven't had many complaints from their community members. Also, the National Recreation and Park Association supports a ban on tobacco in all parks and recreation centers. So it's a national trend. Just a sample sign we could put up or whatever you decide. Also, if anyone's interested, there is the Green County Tobacco Free Coalition. The Ohio Department of Health has uh, the Tobacco Free Ohio Alliance. And a lot of this effort is being put forth by the Ohio Department of Health Tobacco Use and Prevention and Cessation Grant. Anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. And lastly, you can see butt waste is, isn't just litter. Filters falsely reassure smokers and cigarette waste damages ha habitat, landscape, and ecosystems. They can ignite destructive, deadly fires, poison wildlife and children, and they consume tax dollars for cleanup and disposable, disposal that lasts forever. So, any questions? Thanks, Renaz. Well, Brian and I can attest to the amount of cigarette butts because we spent Saturday morning and early afternoon cleaning up the trail with a group um, of nonprofit volunteers uh, with something that the Community Foundation put together. It was, that was really the bulk of the trash. Um, that was there. Um, have you talked to Green County Parks? Or have they adopted this? No, we are going to approach them soon. Okay. Because it would be nice, I mean, if we're thinking about it, it would be nice to have it on all of the trails, right. on all of the bike trails. No, I agree completely. We will be approaching them in the fall and the county commissioners. That's who will make the ultimate decision from the park staff that I spoke to. So okay. it's just a progression. We'll be speaking to other jurisdictions in Greene County also moving forward on this. Shernaz, so. um, I wanted to go back to signage. So you're saying that Greene County Public Health will like put signs in all our parks? We're willing to, yeah, okay. at least a couple. I mean, like Gaunt Park would need probably, you know, like at the front entrance and maybe up near the pool, we would have to just count out how many we would need. Okay. And if we can, you know, probably seven to eight we can supply. And I'll see if we can get more. We're just trying to get an idea right. based on who's even showing interest, mm -hmm. what we can do. And I'm sure if we find a great momentum with this, we will find the money. I will make sure we find the money to do this. Mm -hmm. Council, is this something we're interested in? Yep. Yeah. Do we want to task a I, I was just going to say that we should ask. Um, or environment. Um, I think we can just have yeah. staff start to work on it. I'd like to hear from, from Chief about, you know, would we have an area, I think mostly about Gaunt Park, if people are coming, they come there from out of town, they may not be expecting it. Is there some place, would we have a little smoking area, a yeah. small smoking area or something? So, you know, I just like to task staff with maybe looking at some of these policies and putting some mm -hmm. ideas together. And I want to think about the Bryan Center in particular. <clears throat> so, of course, the skate park, but right. I, I want to think about the whole area, actually. Well, and, I, and our own staff, I, I do believe we have smokers on our staff, so mm -hmm. that's something um, to, to take into consideration. And, and there well, are some nice sites online to look, if you're looking at covering or receptacles, and I think you might have seen them there, I can send you links for that if that's some, an option that you're looking at also. I don't, I don't think that we need to make an area for smoking employees personally. A lot of places do not. And, um, you know, people can go on a break and go off the grounds or whatever. But I, 
I mean, that's a pretty standard in a lot of places. That the one thing that I would like to point out uh, about the Bryan Center, not that I'm disagreeing with the no smoking policy, um, but it, we do have a lot of rentals in this building, people who rent it for events that come from other places um, that, you know, they're they're bringing in relatives or, you know, groups or whatever, and a lot of those people smoke as well. So that is also a consideration for at least the Bryan Center. It seems that it could be something that could be phased in, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, and maybe mm -hmm. we, there starts with, you know, putting the signage up. And, you know, I just think if we look at policies, if we look at how other communities are handling it, I think that should give us a good start. I have a question. Um, if we put up no smoking signs, and I was just at um, Ellis Park yesterday, and I did see I, have, I did see uh, cigarette butts. So if we put up a no smoking sign, and someone chooses to smoke, um, does it make sense to also have some kind of container for cigarette butts? It's and kind of inviting people to break right. the law at that point. Yeah. yeah. That if you don't, then they just drop. That's that's true. But if you have signs going in that no littering and no smoking, at least they hopefully will take them with them off site or put them out. And if they see it after time, if they see it again and again, and then it's on the website, if we maybe do some public outreach and a campaign, put something in the newspaper. I mean, it could be something that grows on people they'll you know in the beginning this could be like wait they don't want us to smoke it's something that has to grow on people i do like the idea of combining it with littering and i think so then again that puts the onus on staff to be sure that we have trash cans mm -hmm. um i you know i know for example that the parking lot up at, on railroad street mm -hmm. is a real mess it's used a lot and there isn't a trash can anywhere near that so that would be a good area to have a trash can. If they want to put them in, put butts in the trash can, then they can. But at least we're not having a cigarette dispenser or or one of those. Disposal. And a cigarette disposal. butt is a, it is litter. Oh, oh when you throw it on the they, ground. They, if they, I was to take paper yes. and throw it on the ground, I would be fine for litter. Tobacco products, cigarettes should be treated the same way because it is litter and it doesn't break yeah. down that easily, and it's got toxic chemicals in it actually so, so no littering sign and a trash can is the same thing what Patty Bates was just saying you have a, a no uh, smoking and a, uh, something go for your butt same thing you're not promoting the, the, the break because you have a trash can with a no littering sign does but, that make sense? but on the other side of it is like we said we have a lot of people from out of town they walk up and see it at least they got something, some place to they discard. Put it out, yeah. I mean, they, they could put their cigarette in a trash can. You know, mm -hmm. if they put it out and put it in a trash can. Yeah. Right. Start okay. out. <laughs> um, I'm an odd fellow, and we take care of the B.D. Hughes Park and pick up trash back there. It's just part of our mission. But then I have to take the trash home with me because there's no can back there to put anything in. And when there was a can back there, no one ever emptied it. Thanks for letting us know, Sharon. Yeah. And Patty's writing it down. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Shernaz, and I'm assuming that uh, you'll be hearing from staff with some uh, follow-up. Any other announcements? I know uh, you have one, Brian. I have one. Go ahead, Jerry. <coughs> Excuse me. I had the pleasure of riding with uh, Stephanie, one of our new officers, on, on last Friday uh, evening. It was a couple hours and it was very enjoyable. But one thing that we did notice, and it was kind of rainy and foggy, we still have a lot of folks that are riding their bikes with no lights on them. And, and we were going 25 at the time and until we were right up on them because it was kind of misty and so forth, mm -hmm. we don't see them. And, and we, we know we have folks going through town at a much higher rate of speed. But uh, so we did kind of pull up what the law says 
I'm riding bikes, and it does state that bikes have to have lights at night on the front and the back, so so you're visible. So so I encourage residents in town. You know, it's getting summer, and we want to ride our bikes and so forth. The other problem we saw were most of the riders had on dark clothes, and and you just don't see them until you you ride up on them. So. You know, to me, if you want to ride at night, put the lights on the bikes and put some type of reflective material on on your clothing or something, so you so you can be seen. You know, the, the worst thing that could happen during the summer is someone on a bike gets hit, and b because the law says that bikes can ride, you know, in the center of the street. They still are governed by the same laws that says they they have to be lit at night. So, well, and related. Ryan, yeah. you have some <laughs> solution to that. Uh, <laughs> in fact, yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up, Jerry, because um, uh, Sergeant Knapp came to the um, Active Transportation Committee meeting last month, and one of the things that was proposed is that officers would have the bike lights that Judy has procured, and so when that happens. Um, Basically, they can you know stop, put those lights on the bike, and we wanted to roll that out and kind of give people notice ahead of time, put it on Facebook, put it on the website, to sort of let people know that um, you know we're stopping you for a good reason. Um, and so that's something that I, I assume uh, Brian uh, heard about, and and we're going to work on that. And uh, so we do want to launch a campaign. We thought that May would be ideal because it's Bike Month. Um, but as far, as far as I'm concerned, the sooner we start it, the better. And is there a place this Saturday that they could possibly get free bike lights? As a matter of fact, there is, Karen. Thanks for uh, mentioning that. Yes. We, uh, once again, I love talking about opening day for trails, which is this Saturday, April 8th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, I know the Buckeye Trail Association is going to be there. Mark Heiss is going to be talking in a few. And uh, we've got Green County Public Health is going to be on hand to help with giving out helmets, Judy's going to be in the mix and others to actually show people how to put the bike lights on their bikes. So those are for kids and adults. And uh, there's going to be free safety checks, fix-it station, lots of information, hot some dogs. other goodies. Yes, we're going to have free hot dogs and face painting. So we get to see how good our uh, police officers and fire and rescue team are at uh, painting faces. And bike safety checks. And, yeah, I mentioned that bike safety checks. Those are very important. So we're going to have people on hand for that. Where is it So at? it's going to be in front of the Yellow Spring Station. And um, for those of you that like to ride your bikes, there's also stuff happening at Xenia Station and in Springfield. So you can be on the trail all day and enjoy it. Um, Shernaz also reminded me of, I think, another important announcement. It's a, a, apropos that she's here today because today kicks off uh, National Public Health Week. And uh, there was a really great press release in the packet about some of the things that are being celebrated and highlighted by uh, the public health organizations like health and social justice, anti-smoking, a lot of the other things that um, are, are really important getting out and doing things like being on the trails. So that is from April 3rd to April 9th. And uh, two other quick things. Um, Arts Alive, the Arts Council's uh, ongoing music uh, venue, uh, it's going to be over on Cory Street. Uh, they're going to have a jam night uh, this Saturday. And um, I thought I'd also mention that there's going to be an ice cream social that's going to be um, hosted by Citizens Against Mining at Young's Dairy, and that's going to be Sunday, uh, April 9th. Thanks, Brian. Any other council members have announcements? Okay, we'll move on to um, the consent agenda that includes the minutes of our last meeting, March 20th, and the financials for February. Can I get a motion, please? I just, one thing. Um, Judy, I thought under citizen concerns, um, where we mentioned the website, we should probably put YSO.com uh, because it, it may seem kind of strange. We're not a .org, we're not a .gov, but our website is .com. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Will do. So can I get a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. 
uh, review of the agenda. Is there anything we want to add or um, change um, as the, the location of on the agenda? Um, I have a couple things. Sure. Um, I'd like an update or discussion about the U.S. Bank. And I think, Patty, did you mention it in your uh, I believe it's in my report, yes. So is that a good time to discuss it? Um, fine, it that's fine. entirely up to council. We can discuss what, it now or then. What are you talking about? US I'm not Bank suggesting we Yellow discuss Springs it right now. I just want to make sure it's on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. So I added it to old business. And also then the letter uh, regarding the, the mining that Karen... That so we'll put that under new business. New business. And um, given that, that the, the, I'll say it, the potential future use for the glass farm is listed under old business, but I think it would be great if Denise were able to be here during that discussion, but that doesn't happen till, till old business. And I don't know, if we move that up, Denise, would you be able to? Oh, you I mean, I, I'm assuming that the two commission reports will not be that long. We can keep those to maybe five minutes each. That's the only thing that's really in front of it. Is that okay? We can just keep it where it is? Okay. Okay. And actually, Patty, could you also, when you do your report, talk about um, some of the things you mentioned in the email related to uh, cleaning the alleyway and um, uh, yes. disconnects and clarifying that yes. misinformation? Uh, Brian, would you please review the petitions and communications? Uh, yes. So we got a, a letter that was not in the packet, but it's on the table from Eric Clark, um, who was talking about uh, short-term rentals and whether we actually uh, needed to update the zoning uh, code about that. Uh, Green County Public Health included their annual report, which shows a lot of great activity. Uh, as well as um, the seatbelt challenge that's being issued out to high school students. Um, apparently Yellow Springs high school students and adults uh, were uh, one of the worst as far as wearing their seatbelts, so we should all take that challenge. Um, and I also already mentioned uh, National Public Health Week. Um, Elise Click uh, wrote a letter opposing um, mining, uh, and this is related to the mining per permits that are being asked for by Enan Gravel and Sand. Uh, Vicki Hennessy also had a letter to that effect, um, uh, opposed to the mining permit being granted. Um, Dorothy Bouquet um, uh, highlighted related to the chief search that there were different options to look at. Um, including uh, internal and external hires. And uh, Krista McGall provided a great update about the uh, Jacoby Creek preservation. And I believe she's going to speak a little bit more about that um, during citizen concerns. And I did want to note that we received uh, at least 16 letters uh, as of this packet uh, to encourage the village to di divest from US Bank based on some of the practices that we've talked about. Thank you. Uh, moving on to public hearings and legislation. Uh, first is, uh, we have first reading of Ordinance 2017-05. Just list. title only. Ah, uh -huh, yes, very good. This is repealing section 1248.03, spatial requirements of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1248.03, spatial requirements. Okay, um, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, Denise is right there, ready okay. to go. All right. Um, this applies to um, the amount of land that's required per unit for two family and uh, single attached single family dwellings. Um, one of the goals um, w in the uh, visioning plan, as as well as how the zoning code uh, ended up, was to uh, increase density and. Therefore, no minimum requirements uh, for the square footage of dwellings is in, is in our code, and there is some in ORC. However, by having um, this requirement of 4,000 square feet uh, for each unit in RC and 4,500 square feet for each unit um, in RB is really um, limiting the use of lots. Uh, planning Commission feels that as long as the lot coverage 
and setback requirements, along with the off-street parking requirements are met, that this really isn't necessary to have that in, into the, in that section. Jerry, did you want to add anything from Planning Commission? Sounds uh, like no. Okay. No. Um, any other discussion from council? Oh, yeah, I guess I had a question. So by not having this in, does that mean then that a two-family or multi-family dwellings or attached single-family basically have the same lot requirement as a single-family? In other words, if you have four attached dwelling units, is the lot requirement the same as four, four detached? would be it would be the, set, the setback requirements would be the same however the parking would be different but the so, size of the lot is the same right so for example there was uh, two properties this past year on Dayton Street one um, did not meet the 4,000 square feet per unit but it had plenty of room to put a two-family dwelling on it um, and they had to go through a BZA process uh, they had the parking they had the setbacks Oh, okay. So, so it's removing the minimum lot requirement. Well, there is no, there's no minimum lot requirement. I mean, minimum uh, size of a dwelling. So okay. I mean, we reduce that. Yeah. So the fact that if someone comes in and makes the unit smaller, but then you have this requirement, it kind of it it's counteracted to that. It, it, this was one of the inconsistencies in that in the. It, it, I know you had said to me there's these inconsistencies in the code that make it complicated, and this is a complication that's not that doesn't right. serve and any I, purpose. So let's think, just get rid I think of it. It's just, yeah. I think that's going to be the case when you have a new code and you're testing it out. Right. 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 But this is one of those one of situations those. where it doesn't really serve a purpose. It doesn't, as long as it's meet. And, and we have lot coverage requirements right. for you know. So if it's meeting the lot coverage. Uh, requirement um, setback the setback the parking oh, this is kind of unnecessary yep. any other comments or questions comments or questions from citizens this is a first reading but we'll take a, a vote Judy would you please call the roll yes Sims yes Templin yes McQueen yes house yes Wintra yes uh, next is Ordinance 2017-06. I am going to turn uh, the meeting over to Vice President Hausch as I'm going to recuse myself for conflict of interest. Okay. There he is. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to recuse myself for conflict of interest, but I request the opportunity to speak to it. So okay. You're going to yes. do that yeah. now? Yeah. You have to do it. I know. Um, so shall I read it yes, in? Yes, uh, Judy, if you go ahead and just read it in. And I'll just go by title. This is repealing section 1262.08, specific requirements of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1262.08, specific requirements. Okay. Denise? Can we have a, can we have a motion? We need a motion. We... We need a motion. Okay, yeah, uh, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. All right. So, Denise? Okay. Short-term uh, rentals were added to the zoning code in 2013 as a result of one of the vision uh, requests in 2010 to strengthen the economy. Um, Short-term lodging, such as bed and breakfasts, hotels and motels, are currently permitted in um, the educational institution and business one and two, which is your central business district and then the southern uh, area of Xenia Avenue. But um, <clears throat> this would enable, because there were not, and there have not been a lot of hotels and motels, in fact in, in 2013 we didn't even have Mills Park Hotel open yet, um, this was giving people an opportunity to um, make a little bit of money at the same time it would also meet the needs of people who are coming here. We have a lot of people coming here to stay for a weekend or for a day. The problem with the code is that the definition of that is weekly or monthly. We don't ever have those situations. So not, know, not knowing really what the purpose of the short-term rental is, we assume that it would, would need to be a little bit broader and you would need to include daily to capture anything 
such as someone who's running out their house for a weekend. So that's kind of where that came from. Um, as a part of that, you know, the, the growing business of Airbnbs, there's a lot of um, homes that are uh, advertised in Yellow Springs uh, and are operating as Airbnbs. We can't do it, we can't find out any information the way the definition is for, for those types of mm -hmm. rentals. And what we wanted to do was to be able to have a, a I mean, it was already a conditional use. Short-term rentals are allowed in every district, except conservation and the industrial zones. And this would be a way to uh, have people come forward so we could at least get contact information. We know who, uh, who would be managing the property, emergency contact information, that kind of thing. And Denise, one of the reasons also that this came forward was because of the concern of the um, additional traffic and, and through the neighborhoods and the parking and that kind of thing that could be created by short-term rentals. Um, and I'm assuming that's why they wanted to make it a conditional use was to just to give neighbors an opportunity to be aware that in a conditional use, you, we let the neighbors know that we're having a hearing. In a permitted use, there's no requirement. Mm -hmm. And so, because, I mean, it's, it's still a conditional use, so do you want to talk a little bit about what, what the implications of the changes are? Well, if you make it daily, then, then it really take, in, in captures anybody that's running out their property on a short-term basis. It actually, I think, more fits better with the short-term rental definition. We mm -hmm. don't regulate people who are renting out their homes on a long-term basis. But if they do want to do that on a short term, which is was put into the code, it's it's of no use unless you capture the daily as well as the weekly or up to a month. Right. In fact, they ended up coming back and saying maybe just less than 30 days. And I think the primary concern here was that not, not because we want to make it hard on, on people to be able to do this. Um, it's not something where we're going to be um, constantly after whomever is running the business. It's more a concern that the neighbors know what's going on. They're aware that you're having short-term rentals in your home, um, you know, that kind of thing. It, it's, not to, it's, it's not to capture all those additional dollars. It's a, simply a... Let your neighbors be aware. Let us have the contact information we need so we can call you in case there's an issue. And that way things don't get blown out of proportion and can be handled quickly and quietly. Uh, I'm against this. <laughs> I mean, uh, when we did our new zoning code. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, but if I mean, I'm sorry, but if Marianne's going to speak, she needs to do oh, it Oh, she's going to go you. first. Okay. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I thought we were speaking first and then the public. She can't stay for that. Oh, she can't stay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'm recusing myself from this vote because I have a short-term rental, as I guess will Karen. Um, so for about eight years, I have had uh, two different configurations of a short-term rental. I own a duplex, and for five years, I rented out part of uh, one side of the duplex. So already, my situation does not meet the changes in this current edition, rendition of the short-term rental because it says detached, single family, I own a duplex. Surely there's no reason why someone who owns a duplex can't rent out part of their duplex on a short-term basis. Um, I think that as, this, as the regulation stands, the current regulation, proposed regulation, it's not onerous. It's just that we're trying to regulate something that I think is inherently unregulatable. Uh, I mean, there are people in town who go away for a year and rent out their house. Do they have to come and get a conditional use? There are people in town who rent out um, 
their house for a month or a couple months while they go to Florida or wherever. There are people in town who rent out a bedroom for uh, yoga retreats, for the Antioch Writers Workshop, for things like that on a sort of irregular basis. So there, there are just a lot of different situations. Um, so my, my suggestion is rather than trying to regulate it, is to look at what are the situations that the uh, village government is concerned about and then figure out maybe the best way to, to deal with that. But what I'd like to also talk about is the value of short-term rentals. First of all, there are various uh, online mechanisms for uh, registering for a short-term rental. In fact, Yellow Springs has the website Yellow Spr stayyellowsprings.com which is where a lot of people go when they want to rent a place in Yellow Springs. There's TripAdvisor, that's one, that's another source. There's another one that I'm not remembering the name of. There are probably half a dozen ways online to find a rental. Airbnb just has to, happens to have become very popular because it's very easy and user friendly. Um, and currently, I rent a bedroom in my house on Airbnb. The value, I think that there are a lot of values to short-term rental. One is it provides someone like myself who's semi-retired and relatively low income added income. So it, it's, it's a really important source of income for, for a lot of people. Um, it also is a way for people who want to visit Yellow Springs to have a real Yellow Springs experience. So I have parents of Antioch students, parents of Central State students. Um, last week I had someone who was a, in a mediation retreat. Um, people so, who are um, going to Antioch Midwest and coming in. Uh, so a lot of people are coming into town to use things that are happening in town, which helps, those, uh, helps people have events in town that people can come to. And then, but the majority of people that come to my place and used to come are from either Cincinnati or Columbus, and they're coming for a Yellow Springs getaway. And so, of course, they go downtown, they go to the restaurants, they go to the shops, they go to the brewery, they go to the bike path. I've had cyclists and people on the Buckeye Trail, so two guys are walking the Buckeye Trail, cyclists. So it's, it's such a great way for people to come into Yellow Springs. And lastly, I think given this impersonalized world that we are becoming more and more impersonalized and commercialized and materialistic world that we ha are in, it is a way for people to meet people. And, uh, and that in some ways maybe is the highest value. So clearly I, I have an interest in this. <laughs> And I think it's a great thing. And, but I really would encourage the village government to look at what are the kind of things we're concerned about. And, you know, and renting out a single house uh, and no one is in that is much different than renting out a bedroom. Or, you know. So I, I think I've talked longer than three minutes. I'm yeah, sure I'd like my things not Sorry. to but yeah, Sorry. you're there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Marianne. Um, Judith, should we just continue the public comment? Or did you want to speak? Okay, first? sure. Okay. Um, would anybody else like to speak to this issue? I just want to okay. clarify one thing. Yes. I want to clarify that what we're doing here is we're not creating, we're not adding something new to the code. It was something that's already been in the code, and we just feel that it's of no use without changing this definition. Now, if council feels in the end that they don't even want to regulate it that's up to council or they want to just make it a permitted use and let it go i we just have this in the code and it's of no use unless we make it a little bit broader right and, that's, and, and just to clarify when you say we were talking about planning, planning commission, commission yes. went through a process okay yes. thanks denise yeah um dan And remember, you should uh, state your name. Sure. My name is Dan Rudolph. Um, I own uh, a couple different rental properties in town. Uh, one of them is a short-term rental. Um, at least from first cut, looking at the um, appendix as far as the different regulations that would be 
additionally levied on short-term rentals. None of those probably apply to what I have. However, I can see a lot of different cases where they might apply to other people who are trying to rent out a, a bedroom in an accessory building or a bedroom in their house or a floor of their house to try to make some extra money and to try, um, well, and, it, and it's a positive thing for the, the village, I think. Uh, brings people into town and like it or not, we are a tourist destination and supporting people coming into town and uh, more people spending money in town, the restaurants and, and localities are, are, I think, a good thing. Um, in looking at the appendix on the things that uh, would be real problematic for, I think, a lot of people that have short-term rentals is no more than two adults shall uh, occupy an accessory building. That seems a little draconian. Uh, you have families, they come with small children. Um, you know, maybe you don't want to limit the number of people, but two adults seems uh, aggressive. Parking a minimum of one off-street parking space provided on the lot for the short-term rental. But then it goes on, no new access points or driveways shall be created. Well, if you don't have a parking place that has access to an accessory building or a short-term rental, and you can't add anything for the short-term rental, you're sort of in a catch-22. You just, you just shut down that particular thing. Um, anyway, I think that um, we should do everything in our power to encourage short-term rentals and people coming into town not to dissipate it. Thanks, Dan. Anyone else? My name is Catherine Berkland. Um, some of you know me. I was a, I'm recently retired as a Spanish teacher at the high school, and um, I have my, um, my I built an, uh, an addition to my uh, house for my mother. And so when my mother passed, I, a year later, I decided to offer it as an Airbnb. And I, um, it's been a big help for me since I've retired. And I would second what Marianne said. It has restored my faith in people, particularly adults. I always had faith in kids. <laughs> uh, but it's the kindest and the most interesting. And the, it's made me love Yellow Springs more. Uh, as well, because I see how people just really t think this is one of the most special places on earth, and it's true. I've had poets, I've had uh, people who've ridden their bikes from Cincinnati, I've had uh, yoga masters, and it's just something that I think really enriches the village, and which certainly has enriched me. So I would encourage uh, all of you to think about the big benefits that it brings to the individual Airbnb or whatever you want to call them, and also the people that come, because I think it does create an authentic experience. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, any other comments? Okay. Well, uh, yeah, Eric. My name is Eric Johnson, and uh, I'm considering building. I am building and considering using it as an Airbnb. And I'd just like to echo what Dan said about limiting to two people, because it's going to be a house, and a tiny house, and easily you could have three people or children. I don't know if two adults means no children, but uh, I don't uh, see why it has to be two. Uh, there's no need for that. And, I guess if I'm building it, I'm going to have a driveway, but I don't know if, if I'm going to use it as an Airbnb, whether I can't build a driveway. Denise, would you clarify the uh, two adults part there, please? That only applies to accessory dwelling units, which is already in the code. Um, and it only applies to, it's two adults, and that does not count children. So you could have a family that had three or four kids right. and they could still stay there. Mm -hmm. okay. Just not yeah. if they had the grandparents with them or <laughs> something. I'm just trying to make sure. Yeah. Okay. And Denise, one other thing since you're, you're back at the mic. Um, 
So the requirement of a permit as it stands now uh, for a conditional use is that that continues until there's a change in ownership? Is that what was decided in 2013? It's just if the, if the use continues, it just continues on. They might want the change of ownership to have us update our files, but there's nothing in the code that says. Okay. But so we moved away from any sort of like yearly permit or anything like that, right? That's not. Not for this. Okay. No. And Denise, the, the things that are being changed are just the things that are in bold. Yeah. What? What? Okay. Because, yeah. And the reason the reason I ask that is that. Uh, the underline. Th yeah. Underline. I think planning was looking more at accessory dwellings because the the way I read it, it says short-term rental units may be located in a principal single-family detached dwelling or room in a principal dwelling or a detached accessory dwelling but then we add a language as it pertains to the accessory dwelling right well, that, that language applies to the accessory yeah. dwelling right Mm -hmm. but, uh, I think but to, to be consistent with the language that is already in we were then that's all yeah that was only added to be consistent the, with what's already, what, what's in already there dwelling, Dw you know, dwellings, right. the size of the structure right. the fact that you can't have a new ingress egress yeah. right. um, you have to use your existing driveway which most people would use their driveway to get to their accessory um, dwelling, dwelling. Right. <coughs> I'm sorry that would be the um, can you speak to the the duplex issue that Marianne brought up, please? Well, that the duplex would be it'd be, it'd be like its own unit. Okay. Yeah. So it would that would be okay too. Yeah. Okay. And um, all right. So Patty mentioned that parking was raised as a concern, um, and then you mentioned contact information, and we want that for. Why is that something that's? Well, I mean, people who who rent out. Uh, who rent out a home or an accessory dwelling unit um, for long-term leases they're more invested in the community you know who they are um, they may have children in the schools there's a better way to contact them if, if something happened uh, in the case of someone who was in this accessory dwelling unit that was only here for a weekend mm -hmm. Um, you can't go by Green County GIS to figure out who, how you're going to contact that person because we, we have homes that are not are owned by people that don't live here, but they may have a property manager. So we just want to be able to have a record of who, who we could contact in case there, something happened okay. at the property. Well, but isn't that the person who owns the property? I mean, it, it, you're, you're not going to get the name of the people renting. I'm not saying that. Whatever. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the property manager, in the case of, a, say, someone owns the house, they live in California, they probably have a rental agency that manages the Airbnb for them. We'd want to know who that person is. But there's no difference in the long term rental. I mean, why, if I rented something for a month, do I have to notify you that I'm a, a, a property manager of a, of a monthly rental? Uh, in this, it's it was actually wording was weekly, uh, monthly, but less than but less than a year. You already were supposed to be doing that. So if I if I'm a landlord and I have somebody moves out in six months, I have to notify you. That these right, and that's why we think that's kind of uh, ridiculous because you have people that might start out, but like maybe they're going to live there a year and something happens and they leave. Oh, well, we don't, you know. We don't want to have to capture those people. So we felt that's why less than 30 days would, would capture more of the true, uh, hot more like a hotel, motel type of business that's operating in a residential district. Okay. Um, thanks, Denise. Any other citizen comments before we bring it back to council? Nick? Hi, uh, Nick Budis, um, citizen and um, um, sometime Airbnb lister. Uh, <laughs> I read the uh, the ordinance as um, limiting a, a property owner to one unit. 
uh, and I want to make sure my understanding was accurate. So you could have an accessory structure or you could have a unit inside your house, but not both. Uh, and That was in there as, a, as something to, to, for council to consider. Uh, and, and I want to suggest that that's, I don't, I don't see a productive point in, in that, uh, and that there, there may be people, and I guess a duplex is a good example of, well, there's two units, so you're out of compliance uh, if you're trying to rent both units uh, of a duplex or uh, uh, a room in the house and an accessory structure. Uh, it, it seems like the, the additional file that's in the packet that established a ceiling of uh, five people, I believe it was, uh, before you move into the threshold of being a, a, a commercial bed and breakfast should be an adequate threshold to work with, not, not, the, not the single unit per property. Okay. Thank you. Um, that had to do with boarding homes. I think that there's no regulations at the county level for that until you reach a threshold of five, as he's mentioning, mm -hmm. for boarding homes and such. Um, I think the reason that Planning Commission thought to put that in there, and obviously you can change it, um, was that you could have someone buy a property and rent a room, rent out the rest of the house, rent the accessory structure, and have this going on in a neighborhood, and there's just all that going on. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that was where Planning Commission was coming with that. Okay, thank you. Um, last call on citizen comments. Okay, Judith. Okay. Uh, as I said, um, I'm I'm against uh, this uh, ordinance. Um, I know I talked to Denise earlier, and I know Planning Commission was trying to respond to the fact that we had this short-term rental thing in our in our zoning code, and it wasn't well described and so trying to solve a problem. Why is it in the zoning code? Uh, you, no, I'm not asking you, but I'm just, uh, you were asking me, well, why did, why did you guys put it in the zoning code if you didn't want it in the zoning code or you didn't care about it? And um, just to say, when that big process took place, um, which took months, and we had this consultant, and you know, there was just so much, so many rules. Uh, anyway. Um, my feeling about government regulation when it comes to the zoning code is that we should limit it to, th to limit it uh, to solve problems or if we know you know over time these kind of things can cause a problem then you have rules about it but to go out to have rules that are unnecessary I feel like um, I don't know I start to feel like you know government regulation I don't like it you know kind of like the Freedom Caucus or something uh, just um, you know, uh, we should assume that uh, that people are responsible unless they show themselves to be irresponsible. And, um, you know, we have nuisance ordinances that will capture when people are being irresponsible. Um, uh, I uh, have a home in Massachusetts where they do rent, they do regulate all rentals. And there is the regulation is extremely expensive to what it can be required as someone who rents their home, and I uh, and that's when I was starting to feel like you know big government you know regulation ugh, and uh, you know just feeling the uh, lack of necessity the huge expense that was put on me personally, and so I just want to see a reason for it uh, if we're going to do it. So um, I don't know what we do with the ordinance as it's, or those, that piece of the zoning code as it stands when it seems to be incomplete. And maybe Mary Ann's idea of addressing, you know, if there are specific problems that we try to address those. But, you know, this notion of traffic, I'm always uh, feel like, you know, Yellow Springs does not have a traffic problem. I mean, I go to Brooklyn a lot. Sometimes there's a traffic problem there, but you know it's just and parking. You know it's just you know it's just a whole different level. But um, and not that you know it's not going to be different here. But just I think we want to be careful if there's not really been an issue that we not expect people to come in front of planning commission to have to have you know a short-term rental. You know it's a lot on some people. That's. You know, and, and I fear it could lead to further things as neighbors, 
you know, if there's kind of this, can be this kind of nimbyism or fear of strangers coming in the neighborhood or whatever that can start to lead down a path that doesn't seem to me it's necessarily a very, uh, a, some, a direction we really want to go. Jared? Yeah, being on planning commission, again, we have an area that's not defined. Yeah. And planning commission attempted to define it. If we strike this down, we still need to define what's in there before taking it out. Because from, from a staff standpoint, without it being defined, when someone complains, they, they, they just have nothing to look at as to how to, how to answer. So, yeah. And that's all we're saying in planning, is trying to come up with a definition. I can see some things that we could take out Problem, but we still need some type of adequate definition to define what the short term rental is. Mm -hmm. Patty? Um, Judy mentioned something that we may just want to clarify for people, and Denise, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, if you have, yes, this would become a conditional use, but if you have an existing unit that you use this as currently, then the fee for the conditional use is waived. They won't even come. So they they, they're say. grandfathered they're and they grandfathered don't in. have to come. And we're just going to ask them if they would provide the contact information. Right, because that's the primary goal is the contact information. Yes. Okay, so just as long as everybody understands, if you currently have a unit that you use for this, there's no, you don't, you're not going to have to go through any process. All we're asking you to do is provide us with emergency contact information. So. Dan, for your units, it would be just yours, and so mm -hmm. I just wanted to clarify that so that everyone understood there was it wasn't some big give us a lot of money. <laughs> okay. Um, well, this is a first reading, and uh, we have a second reading of this ordinance at our next meeting, and um, I, I, I'm not sure that we should vote on anything tonight. I, I think it's most appropriate that uh, people know this issue is out on the table. If there are some problems that need to be solved, I would certainly encourage uh, those folks to come to our next meeting on April 17th um, if there's something that hasn't been discussed. Mm -hmm. But I guess I will say that uh, both what Judith and Jerry said resonated with me, and, and I agree with the letters and, and things I've heard. If there's not really a problem, then it doesn't make sense to dig into this. If there is something, we need to address, address that head on. And as Jerry said, if there's something loose in the zoning code, we need to try to tighten that up. Um, so. Uh, Would, uh, other than Denise, is there a need to have any of the planning commission members here to, for the next meeting? Um, I, I think, you know, I, I, I would think that that's. I, I don't think so okay. because, you know, we put it together, you know, we send it to council. Council could turn it down. It could send it back to us to tell us to relook at it. And where it from. Yeah, so. I would just ask that if you decide not to tighten it up for us or explain it better, then consider just getting rid of it. Right. Because honestly, weekly and monthly does nothing, and it's it's very difficult. When I talk to somebody on the phone, they're asking, "Well, what does this mean, short-term rental?" And most times, it's always going to be a, an Airbnb situation. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I think that's. I think that's the one thing is, I, I think we agree that we need to fix it. Yeah. You know, fix the code. And so then the question is, you know, maybe so maybe, maybe one of council needs to come back with a proposal. If, if if we're not going to take the recommendation, then we need to. Well, it, and also, um, I don't want to throw him under the bus, but Ken LeBlanc is here <laughs> from uh, Green County Regional Planning. Um, if anyone has any questions to ask of Ken of, as far as is the county doing anything in regard to Airbnbs or anything like that, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, no, not specifically. Each, we deal with the townships and municipalities and they all have their own zoning. Okay. So, and that has not come up at our, we have a zoning inspectors group that meets every two months and this issue, I don't remember it. Okay, I just wanted to make yeah. sure since you were sitting there. That's fine. <laughs> we're here for it. Okay. All right. Thanks, Denise. Uh, and I guess we should have Karen and Marianne come back in.
Okay, Marianne, you can come back in now. <laughs> Where did she oh, go? She, is, I think she's... Is there another one? Okay, let me get yeah. my bearings again. Um, 07. 07, 2017 07. This is repealing section 1284.08 definitions R through S of the codified mm -hmm. ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1284.08 definitions R through S. Okay, Denise. Oh, and that was a part of the. Do you guys term. want a motion on that? Yeah, okay. motion. motion. So moved. Second. Oh, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, sure. that one was tied to the other one. Yeah. Right. So that one is part and parcel is what. Denise so we're said. saying so go to 18. Oh, eight. Oh, okay. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. 2017-08. Okay. Okay. Title only. Yes, this is repealing section 674.02, removal of plants and weeds by owner of the codified ordinances of the village of Hale Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 674.02, removal of plants and weeds by owner. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, Denise. Okay, you're up so again. council asked Planning Commission to look at the Environmental Commission's amendments to that section, and this is not in the Zoning Code, so this is actually in the General Offenses Code. Um, and the Planning Commission met with two representatives, uh, Nadia Malarkey and Deward Headley, um, in October. At that time, um, in the discussion, a Planning Commission member pointed out that the current legislation only regulates mowing the perimeter of the lawn which was a surprise to both the people from the Environmental Commission as well as some of us on, at the Planning Commission. Um, so they decided, EC, well, they would review it again and come back to us. Uh, some things, you know, December came and then uh, other things that they were working on, climate, something came up. Climate and so actually, they, yeah. yeah, and so it just came back to us in um, March. And basically, um, what they decided to not make any change to uh, the, other than the perimeter mowing, uh, because uh, because their environmental commission and their feeling was they didn't want to encourage gas-powered motors and by saying that you have to mow the entire lawn, that would actually encourage that. So, mm -hmm. um, planning commission uh, was. Uh, okay with the fact that they were striking out the uh, July 1 date for beginning to mow grass. Um, there's already something in there that once it gets to be 12, higher than 12 inches, people need to mow it. We'd start, I know staff is, starts getting calls in, in April and we tell them, sorry, we can't do anything until July 1st. So that, they were suggesting striking that out and then they were adding additional information about what are uh, invasive plants and more, I think a lot of this is more educational than this for us. So Planning Commission just said, you know, we're okay with what they suggested and we're putting it back in Council's lab. And so, um, Denise, two of the things they did was number one, update the uh, invasive plant list. Yes. And. Um, expand and then, that a little bit yes. because of the managed landscapes mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I believe they got that from um, Ohio's Department of Natural Resources mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so um, but it still allows um, grass to grow to a height of 12 inches before you can we can enforce any kind of cutting right, right? regular grass not a managed landscape is that right. correct right. as well? But it only enforces up that perimeter of the lawn. With the managed landscape, is there an issue with keeping things close to the edge of the driveway or street cut back or and, at a, at a it, height? There is, and, and they, okay. I believe they do mention that in there because um, there was, I know mean, Patty had asked me about that, and we would just make sure there's that clear vision uh, when you're backing out of your driveway. And I believe they added that in there that it... I don't see it. No, I don't think so. Um, it's in the grass, it's in the mowing part, but it's not in the natural landscape part. Mm. 
it seems like the natural landscape part maybe should go up as number three and then there's sh maybe the part about mowing could come after that and then there could be something about whatever the landscape is that it, there needs to be sight lines maintained. Yeah, yeah. I really thought that there was something well, in there. I um, think if I read what is now section three, um, I think that applies to managed or natural landscapes, either one. I don't think it limits because it's simply talking about the footage. And I think it would make sense if that were dropped down, if, if three and four sections were flipped. Yeah, because, because then that's actually what I think we, what we talked about and discussed was the it, fact it, that that was. It was. Yeah, so. yeah because it, it, the way it's laid out, it does look like it only applies to grass, but it yes. actually, if you read it, it doesn't specify and therefore would apply to yeah. both. Mm -hmm. So are you, so are we going to switch three and four or is that not necessary? I think logically it would make sense it would if it's make not sense. a huge yeah. deal. So it doesn't look like there's a split between two and four. And, yeah. and Patty, could we hear from you about enforcement and the and the calls you get and your concerns related to yes. this? Yes, I, I do have a concern about the 12 inch height. And the reason I have a concern about the 12 inch height is because um, if you don't have a managed natural landscape, if you're simply, you have grass, and I, like just like my yard, I have grass. I can let my grass grow to a height of 12 inches. Um, it's not, you know, you know, not to get into an argument or nitpick, but grass is not a natural plant. Okay, it's not considered part of a managed natural landscape. And it, the way that this reads, we can't make people cut their grass until it's 12 inches. And we get a lot of calls, as Denise said, it'll start any day now. Um, people calling and saying my neighbor is not cutting their grass, um, they're getting rodents, they're getting snakes, uh, you know, um, they're coming into my yard and they keep calling and we normally we have to say we can't do anything until June 1st and then we can't do anything until it's 12 inches. Um, so there's this long period and we can't make people cut grass. Okay, well, we've taken care of that, but it can still grow to 12 inches. And it can be to 12 inches well before that old deadline. 12 inches to me seems a little bit extreme for grass. I understand it for natural landscapes if you're planting natural plants and you want to have, you know, the wildflowers or prairie grasses or something like that. But if you have bluegrass or fescue or rye in your yard um, and it's getting to be, I mean, 12 inches is like that. So it's it's a pretty good height that it's growing to before we can even ask you to cut it and then there's an enforcement period so it can easily be to 15 inches before we can get it cut what do you mean by the enforcement period um you they have to be sent a letter and then denise is it another seven days or is it 10 days it, it's either seven or 10 days that they then have that to cut their grass and then if they don't cut their grass then there's the follow-up enforcement by the police department and so just because it gets to 12 inches doesn't mean we can automatically make them cut it that day. They have a, compliant, a compliance period, if you will. Patty, um, excuse me. given the way it reads that people only have to cut the perimeter, mm -hmm. which means then they can let the rest of their grass grow to however high it grows. That, that's true. <laughs> How is that? Yeah. Well. I mean, that's a very good point, Marianne. I, I just have concerns with the 12 inches. I, I really do have concerns with the 12 inches because the perimeter can get to 12 inches. Yeah. I mean, I guess I just want council and the community to understand that the way it currently reads is all you have to do is mow you, the perimeter of your yard and you can let the rest of your grass grow to however tall you want it to be. Which, and ordinarily, I'm not into a lot of enforcement, but. I can imagine that there are a lot of people that would appreciate how many, that. How many people, how many enforcement issues are there in a the summer? Oh my gosh. Uh, Around grass, I mean. How many did you have last year, Denise? Well, you know, Ballpark. Yeah. Um, I can probably say zero because we have that July 1. I mean, but we, she gets calls starting in April and she just has to tell people there's nothing we can do until after July 1. 
So ordinarily, so and then the grass not really, right. and the grass has started growing by then. Typically, are pests worse, Nick? I don't know if you know this or if anybody. <laughs> are pests worse in grass than in natural landscape? Pests but like rodents and snakes and things. Um, a, a friend who cultivates his lawn so that he can maximize the number of snakes <laughs> likes to have the lawn cut uh, above nine inches. And you're being serious? Yeah. So, so, so you're saying that grass does encourage them more than, than a managed landscape or than a natural? Oh, I, I can't speak to... Uh, to the comparison, but I would, I would imagine uh, that a diverse natural landscape is going to offer more habitat for more species than one. Interesting. Okay. More exclusive is the more they can hide. That's the thing that people say. Environmental Commission representative said that grass is just not a natural right. place for that. Um, so well, that's why they had no issue with, with you know, mowing at any at any time. With that said, there was one case last year where we kept getting consistent calls about a property that had really high grass on it next to a job, daycare center and there were consistently snakes and rodents coming out. Remember that? Well, uh, the reason is that it was a nesting habitat. That's why the mow date was July 1. And the argument from planning commission or from the environmental commission was, no, it is not a nesting habitat. It is a home for rodentia, et cetera, but it's not a nesting habitat. So that was the difference. Managed natural landscape is a nesting habitat, is a habitat. Grass is just a spot for stuff mm -hmm. to hang out. <laughs> that was the argument. <laughs> so. Thank you. Council, what are we, um, are we interested in adding or, or maybe putting some kind of a time frame in here, reducing the length that the grass can grow to or what? I think the length makes sense as opposed to a date. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if 12 inches is the best, but I, I think that that was moving in the right direction. Nine inches. I, I question this perimeter thing. I, I don't know if Marianne, you were questioning it or just pointing it out, but. Well, I was pointing it out so that people could understand it in case there were people that wanted, that right. were concerned about it. I mean, I, initially, what the Environmental Commission was thinking of doing, if I understand it, was saying, okay, you either have a managed natural landscape, which has certain criteria, or you mow your lawn. But then when the issue of how it was only the perimeter came up, then these environmental freaks on the <laughs> environmental commission, because I was the dissenting vote. <laughs> I'm using my position here. <laughs> um, anyway, they felt like, you know, environmental commission, we can't be telling people to mow their grass because it's not environmentally friendly to do that. But frankly, Myself as a council person, I really think it would be good that we either say people mow their lawn and whatever to 10 inches, 8 inches, whatever. Yeah, I think, I think or they have a managed natural landscape. I mean, meet certain criteria. The thing is, there's some people who have these large grassy areas. It's not your normal lawn. I mean, I, on the south end, there's some very large grassy fields almost. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think grass is beautiful when it's long. I love it. Uh, I really think it's beautiful. Uh, but um, so it's it's just seems, so I don't know what to say. I mean, some people obviously culturally they like a manicured lawn, and they want so they want their neighbors to also have a manicured lawn. And uh, but those big large plots to say they have to be mowed, it's a lot to mow. And I I think having grassy fields are beautiful, so I don't know. Marianne, just to clarify, so what you suggested was either a managed natural landscape with the perimeter cut back for vision and safety, yeah. or if you have a grass lawn, then you mow your grass lawn completely. Is that yes, your that's what okay. I was suggesting? I do hear what Judith is saying, though. I think in a situation where people have huge lawns and there's enough to have a prairie, sort yeah. of, 
But we have to manage, manage, manage natural prairie. It's not grass. Right. Yeah. Right. It's a, yeah, it's a, yeah. yeah. And, and, that, and, that, and that's what, you know, from a planning commission standpoint, uh, once we, we found out that it was just the perimeter, and then we get from Mary Ann's group, they don't want you to use a lot of gas lawnmowers because of the emissions and so forth. We <laughs> we got to stuck at that point. <laughs> so. I was going to say the thing about snakes. Uh, I mean, there's tons of snakes in my neighborhood. I do mow my lawn, but there still are tons of snakes. Um, I've got a wood pile, and they love the wood pile. Mm -hmm. um, if I mean, I just wonder if, you know, if someone's getting a lot of snakes on their property that, you know, and they're afraid of snakes or something like that, I just wonder if mediation can help, I mean, resolve a situation like that because, you know, but if the neighbors don't care, well, uh, Yeah, and one, one more thing I did want to point out that I don't know if it responds to uh, what you mentioned, Judith, is that there is something in the code that says if neighbors if it's agree not someone, to mow, yeah, I, I would not, yeah, I mean, that's maybe we could be have some flexibility because yeah. you know we want neighbors to try to go along and work with each other. Citizen party. comments, um, yeah. Sharon, can you come up to the I didn't ask you before, but could you come up to the uh, I'd just like to point out something why people started mowing their lawns in the first place way back. It was to keep the rodents and and the beasties out of your house. So you're talking about the perimeter of everything, but I would say if you're going to have ordinances about mowing, it should be around dwellings. Because that was the whole purpose people started. But they didn't start mowing grass to have a, a, a beautiful carpet. They didn't even have mowers. They had sheep and geese they put around the house to keep the grass low, to keep the varmints out. But Nick's friend wants snakes in his house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, eat, they eat a lot of mice and rats. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. Ken, do you have some planners with you? still have to come well, up here. Yeah, you yeah, do. Yeah. This is my personal experience. Okay. <laughs> oh, great. The neighbors were immaculate lawn keepers, and he died. Her grass can get up to that tall. And I mow into her yard because one year I went over and walked through that. My grandkids come over and they got ticks from the tall grass. Oh. So um, I'm not worried so much about the snakes and everything else. It is the ticks. And it is supposed to be a bad year. Yes, for, and for you know, bad year or not, but those mm -hmm. can spread disease and do things to you as much as the snakes. So okay. that's what we. That's why. That's a good point. We do that. Thanks, Ken. So I. Oh, Nick. Our naturalist. <laughs> uh, I'm actually here to dive into the weeds a little bit. Uh, <laughs> you're laughing now. Uh, you just but, lost um, 30 seconds. Uh, I, uh, one, I, I'd encourage uh, if, if additional changes are made that there's a, a discernment made between lawn uh, and grass and prairie, which uh, by the time you get to prairie, you're looking at a, at a naturalistic landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and lawn, I, I would encourage thinking about nine inches or less if, if you want to uh, manage for, for minimal um, animals. Um, I'm actually more interested in the um, uh, things that were put in place here to manage natural landscapes and manage uh, in invasive species and, and laud the Planning Commission the Environmental Council for uh, putting together a list. I'd encourage you to look at some things a little bit more uh, expansively in that regard and I'd encourage you to look at a different list of invasive species um, because the ones that are listed here uh, sway uh, heavily towards aquatic species that are, are challenges statewide, but not necessarily a reflection of the ones that cause us a, a lot of trouble in the village of Yellow Springs. Uh, and, um, and I think that the way that um, paragraph two was worded uh, is, I'd, I'd like to see something stronger. I'd like to see uh, council put in place language that says something along the lines of uh, no property owner shall intentionally purchase uh, any species found to be invasive by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources or the Ohio Invasive Plant Council. Um, uh, 
uh, and um, like to see species included on, on the list, and, and maybe that means taking off some of the ones that aren't locally found, or maybe it means you know, spitting it out and having it be a longer list, but things like calorie pair, which uh, you know, council has had to deal with in the streetscape in town. Um, uh, um, Norway maple, uh, winter creeper, which we have, American bittersweet, uh, which we have huge problems with in Glen Helen. Um, common privet, Japanese stilt grass, uh, and lesser celandine, which is a rapidly uh, expanding invasive species that's been, been found in the village. So uh, I encourage some, some additional scrutiny on that. I'm happy to provide kind of written notes of my recommendations, including, yeah, including cool. cleaning up a couple of typos like uh, <laughs> uh, Japanese knotweed is not fallopian japonica. <laughs> uh, so we'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll provide those to Patty and, and appreciate consideration of those. So, so Council, I was going to suggest that, that Nick um, would help. He I was going to volunteer him before he did volunteer himself. So it sounds to me like we should maybe table this one and uh, ask Nick to work with staff and planning, take it back to Planning Commission first. And I know we at least mentioned calorie pair. Yeah. When we talked about this before. So, yeah. so, um, so yeah, while I'm at the there. microphone in, in section four, what might become section three, uh, there's language that says uh, you can you know, have your naturalistic landscape so long as the original vegetation was per removed prior to planting. Since we don't know what that original vegetation was and it might be good stuff, uh, I'd encourage uh, something as long, something along the lines of so long as pre-existing non-native vegetation was was removed. Uh, Nick, you're going to have plenty of opportunity <laughs> to work on this. <laughs> you're you're going to be our expert. I have a I have a request. Also, would you be able to provide uh, photographs of the invasive species? Uh, the Ohio Invasive Plant Council website has great documentation of that would save, save me some, some research. Can you write that reference down? Because I think if we list plants and people don't know what they look like, <laughs> it's not going to be as Did powerful. I, I just encourage you to go, it goes back to environmental commission. Uh, planning, okay. Right. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Marianne? Then we'll, then we'll take what they do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds great. Kick it around a while. Okay. Do you folks want to do a motion to table, or do you just want to wait for it to circle on back? Because tableage is generally coming back within one or two sessions. Mm -hmm. um, so then, well, well, what's the next? What's Actually, the alternative? I think we need to act on this soon. So right? yeah. Well, it's, uh, Brian, it's not that I disagree with you, but even if you passed it at the next meeting, it wouldn't go into okay. effect until almost June first, anyway, right. okay. uh, because it's an ordinance and it takes thirty days. Um, and since I won't be here at all next week, um, it's going to be difficult to probably get that back. But then. I mean, the Environmental Commission can deal with the list of mm -hmm. no, non-native species, invasive species. The Environmental Commission is not going to deal with the height of the grass or whether the whole whole lawn should right. be mowed. I mean, it's, it sounds to me like Nick really has. You know, he's he's. He's talked about nine inches. It sounds like he kind of has the whole thing covered. I think you're hearing from council generally that we would agree that there needs to be some sort of height on the grass and then whatever, you know, expansion we can have on these invasive species, I think. And it sounded like we wanted to go beyond the perimeter. Yes. Right. Um, I think we should bring this back at the next meeting. Okay. And because well, we've got that well, planning board. We just can't. I mean, if yeah. it doesn't have, the well, planning commission meets next week. Oh, we do? Well, do it, does it have to go back to planning and environmental commission? I mean, all we need to do is update the list. Yeah. And discuss the other things. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't need to. For Why would they need to review it there? They, if uh, the needs Nick's going to gonna do that. that. Does it have to come back to planning? No. Okay. It's on out. Okay, so it just it will just come back to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. then if we can get it all done, then so we will table it. A motion to table. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, thanks, uh, everybody. Next is resolution 2017-17. So are we taking 07 away here? Is that just? Go away. Oh, seven goes with uh, 
the B and B one. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Sorry for that confusion. Uh, title only, Brian, or do you want this? Yeah. Okay, this is authorizing the village manager to sign a memorandum of understanding with the Buckeye Trail Association, designating the village of Yellow Springs a Buckeye Trail town. Can I get a motion, please? So move. Second. Uh, okay, um, we have Mark Heiss here again to talk to us about um, Yellow Springs being a trail town. Good evening. Hi, Mark. The. Uh, this has a bit, been a very long road, or long trail, as I should say. Um, after having lived here for about 10 years, I decided to go to a trail fest, Buckeye Trail Fest, in uh, Hocking Hills, and found quite to my surprise that the Buckeye Trail came right through the center of Yellow Springs, up the bike trail, and then hooks, uh, hooks west and heads out uh, towards Fairborn, down Dayton Street. And that was kind of troubling because at the time I was also writing a blog on Ohio Adventure uh, uh, activities. And so I came back and the very next day came and talked to Karen at the chamber and said, why did I not know that the Buckeye Trail did, went through Yellow Springs? And she agreed that that was a very good question. I also discussed with her that that year, which was the first year that trail towns were to be designated, the uh, city of Xenia as well as the city of Dayton were to be designated as trail towns. And I said, why shouldn't we? Well, there were no good reasons why we shouldn't other than the Buckeye Trail Association kind of asked us to wait because, well, we just had Zini and Dayton declared as trail towns and they were only going to do two a year. And so last year when, with the uh, announcement of the International Trail Symposium coming to Dayton, uh, Karen reached out to the Buckeye Trail Association, who then reached out to me and said, hey, we'd like to be a trail town. What do we need to do? What do we need to close up? And so we decided that the best way to do that um, was to go through their packet. And uh, for me, the best way to do that was to bring Trail Fest to Yellow Springs, which would guarantee us becoming a trail town. Uh, as a result of that action, um, actually, that was the one of the reasons that Greene County declared this the year of the trail, and the last time I was here was also declared by the, the village of Yellow Springs that this be, that 2017 be the year of the trail. Essentially, the memorandum of agreement is between the Buckeye Trail Association, the village, and the North Country Trail uh, as, uh, Association. And what this does is it allows us to interact, um, allows us to be resources for each other, and allows us to promote the trail so that people don't live here for 10 years and not know that it's here. It also allows us to, as the Buckeye Trail Association, to assist the village in um, identifying areas where they can leverage the trail for um, economic building, uh, economic development, and also um, to assist the uh, village as well as the village assisting the Buckeye Trail in promoting the trail and helping to keep it up. Very good. Any comments or questions? Well, and we added uh, the reason that you see in the Yellow Springs mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce in there is because the chamber has agreed to partner with us um, because certain parts of this uh, memorandum of understanding require uh, publicity and promotion, and the chamber has agreed to assist us with those pieces. Great. Yeah, and I, I just want to emphasize how important the signage thing is. So thanks for emphasizing that because it's so important that people know, you know, the amenities we have. So absolutely, I'm 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 very excited. It's, as was pointed out uh, earlier in the uh, uh, discussion about the, from the Green County Public Health Department, uh, this is this is an important thing for us to be getting out and getting active and and enjoying our outdoors, but leveraging it. Um, not only for the economic reasons, uh, but also to just get people out away from their screens, become disconnected, and, uh, and be able to walk the trails and have a place to uh, unwind, get away from things. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Comments or questions from citizens? Brian, would you call the vote? I'm going to abstain. Okay. Since the chamber's mentioned. All right. Uh, Judith. 
You can just say all, the, all those okay, in favor. All those in favor? <laughs> did, wait, did, wait a minute. Did, I don't know if we got a motion. Yeah. Did, we, did we get a motion? We did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All, okay. Right. all those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Uh, 2017-18 type only. This is an agreement between the Village of Yellow Springs and the Green County, Ohio Engineer for a Cooperative Paving Program. Uh, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, Patty? Yeah, this is the uh, agreement that we, the resolution that we pass every year that allows us to participate in the competitive bid program uh, with the Green County Engineer. Um, saves us money on the paving that we do every year. And I'm looking for the roads that are going to be paved because I know that somebody's going to ask me that. It's not in the packet. It is. Oh, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, oh, it is. Uh, Dayton Street, Cliff Street, Orton Street, and Allen Street. And we may also repair the curbs in the Bryan Center parking lot this year in preparation for paving it next year. Um, so those are the streets. This this resolution is just a standard resolution that allows us to participate. So in Patty, does, does Cliff Street include Railroad Street? It doesn't, and the reason it doesn't is because we have to fix the drainage under the parking lot, and uh, that would make us dig up Railroad mm. Street right after we paved it. Okay. So Railroad Street will be next year as well. Okay. It, it, is it going to get some patching? Uh, it, yes, it will get some patching. Thank you. Um, okay, all those in any other comments or questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And finally, resolution 2017 19. This is authorizing the village manager to renew health insurance for village employees for the 2017 18 plan year. All, uh, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, Patty. Um, this is our annual renewal for health insurance. Uh, as everyone knows, we've been really lucky uh, for the last few years and, and uh, not gotten any increases. And in fact, um, because we've worked with um, changing the plan around a little bit, we have actually had decreases, but we were not so lucky this year. Um, we have, I believe it is a 7.5% increase, which is still, uh, it sounds horrible, but compared to some of the other increases that are going around out there, that's really not bad. Look at Carl's going, yeah, that's not bad. So um, we feel pretty lucky that um, we're able to do this with a 7.5% increase. Um, and as you note, um, in the plan, they're in the... Uh, uh, exhibit there, um, the employee pays 15% of the, of the um, premium and the village pays 85%. Okay. And the this coverage is a month, stays the same? The coverage stays the same. Okay. Is this a monthly cost yeah. that's on this, uh, yes. or is it? Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, it says per month, sorry. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I have a question. Oh. How, do, how does the health savings account plan fit into this? Um, we do have a health savings account plan that we provide to any employee that um, participates in it. Um, we make those deposits quarterly into the accounts set up by the employees for that. It, this doesn't change the amount that goes in. That's set by a separate ordinance. And that's the family 3250 and the single uh, $1,000. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It, it's a very, I think it's very generous. So I think it's good. That. Any other comments or questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, now is the time in the agenda where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. We ask that you come up to the podium and uh, keep your comments to three minutes. State your name also. Hi. Hi. My name is Mike Verbillion and I'm here representing uh, Citizens Against Mining, Mad River Township. You guys may have heard of what's going on. Excuse me, uh, can you spell your name, please? Sure, it's uh, V as in Victor, mm -hmm. E-R, V as in boy, I-L-L-I-O-N. Thank you. Uh, here to ask uh, for the support of the Yellow Springs Village Council uh, against Ian and Sand and Gravel's proposed limestone quarry and their application for a continuous use permit with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Uh, they've applied to combine uh, some existing old permits uh, and to mine limestone with a substantial dewatering needed, which covers 420 acres uh, in this community, uh, and it could start as soon as uh, May 21st of this year. Uh, proposed phase one is 
is less than a mile and a half down the road. Uh, I'm one of the 300 property owners directly affected. Uh, I live and work on the family farm. It's been in the family and operating since the 1870s. Uh, if the permits are approved, uh, the location of the quarries would be from Green and High School uh, down to Cumpsa Road towards Yellow Springs, uh, and then between Garrison Road, Fairfield Pike, and South Tecumseh Road. Uh, the permit includes a dewatering plan consisting of pumping 220,000 gallons a minute into Mud Run Creek. This will lower the water table to facilitate their mining. Uh, no one knows the effect on the environment, the water quality, or the water quantity. Uh, for anyone with a well within the cone of depression, uh, with the majority of the depression is south of phase one. So it's coming right into past Ellis Park and into Yellow Springs. Um, we don't know what kind of effect it have on the wetlands around here or the animals in the vicinity. Uh, again, phase one is approximately one and a half miles from Ellis Park and Yellow Springs. It consists of 115 acres with a projected depth of 130 to 150 feet, and it will be active for the next 40 years. They're estimating they're going to take 300,000 tons of limestone out a year, and that translates into 25,000 to 30,000 dump trucks uh, on the county roads to move the limestone, some of which is going to come this way and go right down 68. Um, you ask how this will affect the community. Uh, anyone with a well will be affected. It could go dry, especially the deeper they go, and how their blasting affects the aquifer. From the dynamiting, there are concerns of res residual chemicals leaking into the aquifer. Uh, there's also damage to brick homes, foundations, and windows from the blasting. Um, all the insurance companies we've contacted for homeowners insurance have said that you needed to up your policy to include earthquake insurance and mining insurance if available. Uh, there's going to be extra traffic. No one knows really how it'll affect the roads here locally. Uh, noise and air quality will both be affected. Uh, not to mention the safety concerns for the people using the bike paths and walking the, on Tecumseh Road and the surrounding areas. Um, this will also lower the property values within a five mile radius of the quarries from five to 25 percent with a subsequent reduction in tax revenue to the local governments with people not wanting to move into the area or stay in the area. Uh, how can you help? Uh, we, I'll leave some flyers out here as I go. Uh, we have a website listed on there. I don't know if it's up and running yet because this is just, we just found out about it at the 11th hour. Um, we are, uh, there is a Facebook page, Citizens Against Mining. Uh, and there's a online petition that can be signed there. Uh, we're going to be sending a copy of the petition out to the Attorney General, Clark County Commissioners, Green County Commissioners, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, the Ohio EPA, the Local Zoning Board, and the Board of Zoning Appeals for Clark County. Uh, that's it. Thank you. I mean, we, we you do have, go ahead. I was going to say, I'm just looking at my GPS because I'm trying to see where is the actual mining. So, so go down. Phase one, if you would go out of town here on, uh, past Ellis Park. Jack, so Jackson, Jackson Road. Road yeah. Turn to the uh -huh. left on Jackson Road. It'll curve to the right. After it curves, it dead ends into the property. Okay. Oh yeah, if you've got a. I can do that. And uh, in the in the the body that makes the decision. Uh, say again. That's up in the air. Well, well I, I mean, it, it's ultimately zoning, isn't it's, it? And, well, and it's ultimately going to be zoning, and the Clark County Commission nurse are going to have to try to enforce the zoning. And I, we did draft a letter. Mm -hmm. Council has seen it. Um, yeah. My understanding. When's the next hearing? Uh, as far as we know, ODNR is going to have a hearing on the 21st okay. to approve uh, or disapprove the permits. Everything we've been told is that ODNR rubber stamps them uh, just because they're afraid of the state being sued. 
so we don't know exactly how that's going to affect anything. Uh, Board of Zoning Appeals, we don't have a date for that yet. Uh, they're waiting to see if the ODNR does approve the uh, property as well. So, Council, I mean, it sounds can, can like we, we, go ahead, sure, yeah. My, oh, my thank you. Okay. Basically. Yeah. Yes, thank you. The, the, the little quarry that's uh, where the old remember the old elementary school, school? school? Yes, yeah. sir. and there's a little quarry just south of that. Yes, is sir. That is. part of it also? Both or? of those are the are included in this. Uh, that is where uh, Enan Sand and Gravel is trying to encompass, get everybody to think that it's just those existing uh, quarry or existing gravel pits that are involved. Okay which those existing gravel pits have been played out for years. Yeah, I, I thought when, that. When this came out, I actually went to Soil and Water in Clark County and got the first map of what was shown, and ding, 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 it's limestone quarry, limestone quarry. They're not worried about a gravel pit. They're okay. wanting to make two so, limestone okay. quarries. Okay. Uh, when they get done with it in 40 years, the first phase one, uh, you're going to have a 78-acre lake there, 130 to 150 foot deep. So what is the zoning of the property right now? The zoning is all A1 agriculture. Oh, so it isn't, it hasn't been zoned mined? No, and the two properties in question have not been mined since the turn of the century. It's been farm ground this whole time. What's the benefit of it? Who benefits Enon Sand and Gravel? Enon Sand and Gravel, which is owned by Jurgens Corporation, which is in... Sabina. I, I, I mean, I, I will say, in, in, in support of the construction industry, anybody who uses sand and gravel benefits. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and in some respects, the closer it is to a site where it's going to be used, it might be beneficial. I mean, yeah, there's going to be a lot of trucks on the road, but maybe there's less truck traffic than if it was coming from a farther distance. I'm not trying to say I support no. this, no. but but I mean, well, sand saying, and gravel is important for the construction sure. industry. And, and so it creates sand and gravel for them, is that it? That's no, it's no. going to create limestone. For limestone. Them. Okay. Limestone. Yeah, that's, that's what they want the permits for. They want the permits yeah, for, yeah, for a limestone quarry. Well, this doesn't have anything to do with us. I mean, this, we, this, would, this would be a letter that we would write in support or action that we would take in support of these folks and against this. I mean, that's what we're discussing. We don't have any jurisdiction. Basically due to its proximity yeah. to Yellow Springs. And most of the people that are affected with this, once you get past Jackson Road, have a Yellow Springs address. What, what, do you know what the limestone will be used for, how it's used? Uh, they use it, they'll process it into different sizes. It could be used for gravel driveways, uh, agricultural lime. They pulverize it, what's left over, they spread on the fields to bring the pH down, or you can purchase it for that. I, I'm assuming it'll be the same as as Semex. It's, they're it's, producing... Um, it's not the same. Semex actually produces the stuff for concrete. Uh, they're basically looking to do it for gravel driveways, big rocks for drainage, uh, and that type of thing. And they're trying to smoke screen it with the gravel part of it, which there is no gravel associated with. And phase two is gonna be about 140 acres, uh, which is gonna be right on down the road, close to Green and High School. And uh, the biggest concern is the dewatering, the pumping right. down of the aquifer mm -hmm. and the wells, and it's the, uh, is Landowner or homeowner, you have to prove that their pumping of water caused your well to go dry. Is is there a, a, a more uh, environmentally friendly way to mine this stuff? No. no. Uh -huh. It's all drilling and dynamiting and... Uh -huh. And using that water process? And the dewatering because as they go deeper, they hit the aquifer, the water comes out, would flood mm -hmm. what they'd already done. So they continually, continually pump water until it's over with, until they get all the resources out of the ground that they can come up with. Uh -huh. And then the aquifer is what fills it with water? Uh, it would leach back in from that and from groundwater as well. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a groundwater issue as well. Mm -hmm. So, Council, do we want to thank send you. the letter that, thank Thanks you. very much. Yeah. Um, or should we just wait to talk about this when it's on the agenda or do we want to wrap it up now? That's right.
Let's wrap it up now. Okay. Yeah. So do we want to send the letter or do we want to draft something different? Just send this. Uh, I thought what you wrote was. I have a list as well of suggested. Okay. Oh, that's perfect. That's, I assumed it was would be more than ODNR, which is what we have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you want to read it? Um, I, I just wanted to support this group as strongly as possible. Crystal Goff, Mill Springs, and Consolia Trust. Um, you know, we, we have weighed in and tried to reach out to um, pull some scientific help uh, to, to the aid of this cause. And it, it's, yeah, it's, it's a pr pretty devastating process for an area that's that developed with houses right now. Mm -hmm. So, and it's also a very good aquifer, which I got to say is like our biggest resource in this general area right now. So, there's there's just a lot of risk that's introduced. Does it to, risk our water supply? To water, um, th there's connections. There's this massive underground aquifer that is connected. It's like big underground rivers, you know, and it's just there's no guarantee of safety. Right. And, it, and I mean, this the watershed actually goes down to Whitehall and west on towards Fairfield. So absolutely, it affects a lot of Yellow Springs addresses. And, on the back um, of the flyer, there's a, a radius of yeah. the affected area. It comes all the way into uh, Dayton Street in Yellow Springs. Right. Okay. So, Thanks, Krista. Thank I like the letter you wrote, um, Karen. But I wonder if we, if it could affect our water supply, or you know, that you know, if, if we would want to add a paragraph uh, of I, of concern regarding that as well. I guess my, unless we know for sure that it is going to affect our water supply, I guess I I am uncomfortable making a as a government body making a claim that something's going to happen. Well, if maybe not, the way we could put sure. it is that everything's connected, kind of the, the kind of language Krista it, said. It's oh, not I, within the five-year time. Of I, right. I met with Brad Alt, who is our water and wastewater treatment superintendent. Um, we looked at all of this and discussed it. Um, while it will dramatically affect folks who have um, uh, wells and, and, I mean, exactly what Mr. Verbillion said, um, it, we do not see any direct indication that it could affect our aquifer that we pull from for our supply. I also emailed the information that I had to um, Matt Reed, who is the chair of our planning commission as well as a hydrologist, and um, Matt was going to look at it and get back to me, which he didn't, but his initial reaction was that from what he sees and, and what he knows, um, he doubted it would have a huge impact on our, our actual water supply that we draw from. Do we know about Ellis Pond? We don't know about Ellis. Well, the other thing, um, I'm just wondering uh, if we wanted to strengthen, you know, just our, our concern about the, um, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, leaving U.S. Bank because of the, you know, the Dakota um, uh, access pipeline. pipeline and the whole issue of water there. So we're in solidarity with those folks for the, for a similar reason. I mean, it's to the water here. So I, don't, I just wonder if there's some way we want to maybe if somebody has time. Okay, to, I'm. I'm drafting a sent, I'm, and I won't get it done, but something to the effect of while we are unsure whether this will have an impact directly on the village of Yellow Springs, we understand the importance of the underground aquifer. Maybe I can get some language yeah. from Krista. Yeah. So yeah. add that yeah. to at least acknowledge that, that we might be impacted. Yeah. And, and maybe something also, you know, like I say, referencing our, like I say, solidarity with uh, the water protectors, you know, the, not necessarily use exactly that language, but. No, I wouldn't. What? I don't, I don't think solidarity with the water protectors is going to I wouldn't yeah, use I, that language, no, but I, just, in this situation, yeah. right. I, mean, I see this as different than, than the other decision because this is us, this is a governmental body talking to another governmental body. I want to be a little a, a little careful in how we word it. Um, Sharon? Uh, I uh, went through a thing like this 45 years ago, deeply, between Stark and Summit County. And we're going to put a sand and gravel pit there. 
which we stopped. They didn't. But I would like to point out that, yeah, the water is probably in danger, but I wanted to point out the great beauty of strip mines because that's what it is. And if somebody was mining coal like that up there, everybody would say how ugly it is. It's just as ugly when you take all the topsoil off and that earth can't be used again to raise more food for people. That's important to keep in mind. That there is that one little strip mine there, the one he was talking about. It's ugly. It's dead. It's moonscape. Dan? Yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking about the letter that you're talking about now and uh, possible language that you could put into that and to, to perhaps um, strengthen it without overstepping, right? Mm -hmm. you, you guys don't want to. Um, say something that really can be backed up on behalf of the village, but uh, it's possible, and I, I don't off the cuff know the exact language, but the village could urge the appropriate bodies who are reviewing uh, this, which would be, I guess, Clark County Planning, uh, that uh, before they go ahead with an approval, you know, the village could be urging them to secure an independent hydrological study within some parameters to understand the water impacts that are of a significant concern to us as neighboring uh, a neighboring municipality that relies on uh, adjacent watershed or, or water table. That's that's great, yeah, that's good. Yeah, so I mean, to okay. at least you know, kind of put that in the mix and perhaps slow the thing down enough to have a good conversation. Sure. Yeah. Shanaz. Thanks. That's a great oh. idea. Good. And remember, clean water is going to be one of the biggest issues in the future, and it is a public health issue, too. Thanks, <laughs> Ms. Public Health. <laughs> yeah. uh, one, add, one last comment. Uh, the village being and uh, had their independent hydrologist take a look at it as well. Uh, Enid Sand and Gravel had their hydrologist as the one that submitted the plans to ODNR for approval. And Enon's hydrologist has said that uh, even though Enon is about the same distance as your well fields from there, that there's significant uh, areas that ODNR and the current plan didn't cover. Uh, so it, it may be beneficial to have someone else take a look at their findings and, and come up with some of your own. Ken, do you know, does Clark County have the equivalent of Greene County Regional Planning? Their regional planning is more like the MERPC. Um, and are they, would they be looking at this? Well, that's transportation, but they, yeah. have, they have a Clark County planning department that handles the zoning in the subdivision. So what would Green County Regional Planning be saying? Whoa. <laughs> now that's on the bus. <laughs> I can't speak for them until I look at it. That's true. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I can't speak what they're doing. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the county planner uh, is uh, ha has weighed in. It seems to be feeling, you know, very strongly about fighting this, and is concerned that ODNR may not turn it down. But um, there really were some problems with aging of permits, I think, and exactly what land permits property ownership went with. Yeah, and and so this was sold. And um, those permits don't appear to have really traveled with the, with the sales. And, and so there's some evidence there that they also have to work with in terms of this actually being new permits to be issued. OK. So, so Council, we, we have the, the letter that I started with. Um, I will add I liked um, Dan's recommendation about a hydrological study um, and something about protecting the underground aquifer. Would council be satisfied with those changes and going ahead and sending it? Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I think it's pretty yeah. urgent. Yeah. Okay, um, I guess we're still in citizens' concerns. Any other citizens' concerns? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just wanted to say briefly, I did put, for information purposes, where oh, yeah. we're at on trying to do 
uh, a bigger green belt uh, preservation effort and hopefully leverage our green space funds. Uh, we're definitely working with the winning bidders on the Arnavitz property, and I think we'll get the bulk of the property protected within a year or so. Uh, tomorrow we're actually going to have some visitors from Nature Conservancy that do stream restoration. They have that responsibility for the state. They've got mitigation monies to spend. And they're real excited about this being, you know, a, a part of, their being a part of this project. So um, I'm working on a grant uh, for, I'm hoping a fairly large chunk of the watershed, potentially even involving the well field and waters to the east of Yellow Springs as well as to the west. Um, and we'll do a pre-proposal to uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service by uh, April 21st. And then we would find out by <laughs> June uh, what, whether we were being invited to do a full proposal. Right. That would then be due, due by the end of September. And at that point then, we have a specific budget to work with. And then they want to have specific commitments as far as dollars and partnerships right. from all the different players. But so far, we're just getting a great reaction from folks. Um, if we go for the full proposal and we get funded, we would know by November. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks, Christy. We really appreciate it. One quick question. Oh. I was unclear. Um, I'm, I've been unclear. Do do we know now, in terms of the monies that the village made available, um, where that's at? In terms of, I, I don't think it looks like any of those buyers are going to actually need those dollars to close with, but they do want to pursue an easement. And so what we're looking for is, are there ways to use the dollars the village put in, the do dollars from the park district, they put in $25,000 also to the Green Space Fund. And uh, we had 138 donors that, that donated about $161,000 or pledged. Okay. Um, to the land trust. So um, I, I don't know, um, it, we would rather not just use those dollars yeah. and have them spent. We would rather use those dollars to leverage other dollars right. and even in addition to that, dollars to protect the rest of the, the green belt. And, and it seems to me that if that, if you put together that kind of a plan, it, it's another um, funding opportunity. It's another fundraising opportunity. It just opens up the opportunity to bring in dollars from other sources and other citizens and, and other it's, groups. It's a five-year project, and I'm super excited. Xylem is very interested in bringing expertise and equipment. Um, so that we could really get much better quality of, of water indicators than ordinarily is available That's to great. a village. That's great. So that would be good. Thanks, Krista. I, I guess I was just thinking of Xylem relative to the mining issue. I, I don't know if there's any uh, role that Xylem could play. I don't know. Um, any other citizens' concerns? Okay, um, next we have Library Commission end of year report. Now I know why Carl Mr. Cologne is here. <laughs> I was wondering. He just really enjoys Sorry, council meetings. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um, members of council, members of staff. I'm Carl Cologne, the director of the Greene County Public Library, proud village resident for more than a decade now, and it's my pleasure to give you the Library Commission report. Um, I'd like to start with thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you again for the roof. It was very dry inside the library this year, and we have the Village Council to thank for that. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank everybody who serves on the uh, Library Commission. It is uh, spectacularly unglamorous to get together <laughs> in the library and talk about bricks and drainage and oh, things no, like that. Oh, Carl, it's really fun. Oh, Patty. <laughs> but, um, but because we do that, uh, the building is progressively in better and better shape and, uh, and fit for the next 50 years uh, of service to the community, which is something that I really appreciate. And uh, most of all, I uh, want to take a, a long minute to thank uh, the village staff and council for all the help uh, that was put in very, very effectively to get the historical marker uh, to Virginia Hamilton, to uh, Yellow Springs contribution to the world of uh, letters along with many of our other wonderful writers. Um, as many of you know, uh, oh, uh, a couple of weeks ago um, with, uh, with 
the streets closed thanks to, to the police department uh, and to the village. Um, we had many, many students uh, come over and, uh, and didn't really see something that you don't see very often. Uh, to stand in a street where uh, a literary giant had stood uh, and to look at our library and down the street uh, where the, where the uh, Board of Education building is now, which was the old library, and uh, to be able to say to them, hey, an imagination that was born and bred right here, where you are standing, uh, reached out and through her words, changed the world. You don't have to do it for the first time. It's already been done. Now go ye forth and do likewise. And uh, it was a very, very special occasion and uh, many, many hands uh, made that possible and um, I'm just delighted uh, because of her contribution to the world of letters that we have an enduring marker to Virginia Hamilton and her power um, in the village for all to remember uh, long may it last. So again, thank you very much, uh, especially to Patty and Jason and the village staff who uh, sort of snuck the sign in uh, during some fairly wretched weather uh, and, uh, and and made it all possible. Very, very grateful. That That's just not something we could have done on our own. Uh, it's been a busy year at the Green County Public Library. Uh, just in Yellow Springs alone, we, we circulated just about uh, a little over 175,000 items to the folks here in Yellow Springs. Um, that's a lot. Uh, just so you know, uh, we're excited about things that will be coming into the village. Um, as many of you know, we're preparing to open a, a maker space, a, a, an advanced technology space in Xenia, and uh, we'll be rolling out uh, advanced technology opportunities, uh, everything from uh, 3D printing to Raspberry Pi computing and that sort of thing uh, to each of our branches, including Yellow Springs through our Spark kits. We're excited about that. Um, we're very excited to be partnering again this year with Little Art Theater. Uh, the Little Art Theater has worked with us, uh, this will be our second season, um, making opportunities to use the Little Art uh, as part of our summer reading program prizes and, and through other outreach. And uh, we're very grateful for everything that's uh, possible there. We're very grateful to the Yellow Springs Library Association. We have a truly extraordinary group of library friends that make so much of what we do possible. Uh, everything from cleaning the limestone on the building uh, to funding our programming, to reaching out in so many ways. So things I have to say are going very well. Uh, Countywide, we've been busy. Um, we circulated uh, right around uh, 3 point, we, we, the 3.2 million items. Uh, by I just did the state stats yesterday, and that, that's how it all came out. Um, that makes us very, very busy. Um, we're considered to be one of the 20 busiest public library systems serving communities over 100,000 in the United States. We're very, uh, we're very proud of that. Um, we are, uh, we had over 68,000 people come to our programs last year. Um, we are uh, proud to be reaching out across Greene County, uh, and I'm proud to be a Yellow Springer that's part of that. With all that being said, I would be delighted to entertain questions from the council. Uh, when is the Spark Place open yeah. house in Xenia? It'll open, it's uh, April 11th. April 11th, what time? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's at one this, o'clock. One o'clock. This is yeah. a public. It's probably on my calendar. Um, any other questions? So I, I just wondered if you could share a little bit of how the, the maker space will sort of interact with the Yellow Springs Library. You mentioned... Yeah, that's a great kit. question. Um, uh, in a couple of ways. First of all, the, the technology that uh, we're trying to make available. Well, let's take a step back and talk for a minute about why are we doing this, okay? Um, fundamental literacy. ABCs, one, two, threes. Start with simple building blocks, building blocks that you learn by rote. And literacy, the actual process of literacy itself is learning to break down those building blocks and to recombine them in a way that makes the world look and sound more like you. Truthfully, with these technologies, uh, everything from the 3D scanning, the 3D printing, uh, the CNC routers and the lasers and all the other stuff that we're, we're bringing in, um, it's really no different. It's, again, taking a tool and figuring out how to make the world look more like you. Uh, it's now possible using something like a simple 3D print, well, simple 3D printer that we have in the library uh, to print an artificial hand uh, or a hip joint. The world is changing rapidly, and we're going from um, mass manufacturing to individual creation again, uh, very much like we did um, in the farms uh, and, and artisans of, of old. We want to, because we invented things like the airplane, 
here in the Miami Valley. Uh, because we have so many engineers and so many people wanting to reach out and help uh, our communities learn these technologies, we wanted to make them available to everyone. Um, public library is ultimately a place to create opportunity for all and access for all. And we're creating access to these technologies for everyone by building a makerspace and by building uh, what we call spark kits, which are sort of portable versions of these and rolling them out to the different communities. Uh, and I'm not going to kid you. We don't entirely know how these are going to play out. Part of the fun of being a, a we, we're, we're not exactly first. There are other libraries with makerspaces. We seem to be the first that's trying it in a particular fashion that we are. But um, part of the fun of being first is figuring this out as we go. Um, we are actually already in discussion with schools uh, in Yellow Springs because we know there's an interest in the makerspace there. And our goal is, in all cases, to support and never to supplant the efforts that are under, being undertaken by other groups. Uh, we want to learn what the schools do and figure out how do we help. Wouldn't it be cool to have someone have to come for a homework assignment that involved design and 3D printing, soldering, embroidery, Lord only knows what. Yes. Can you define a makerspace and what goes into it? Um, a makerspace in, uh, in brief is a, uh, it's, it's a workshop uh, and it's generally a, a, an advanced technology workshop. So uh, the advanced technologies in the case of the Xenia makerspace include uh, everything from a, a vinyl printer, which is about yay big, to uh, multiple 3D printers, uh, uh, a laser etcher, uh, a CNC router, uh, a recording studio if you want to come down and record your podcast, uh, or eventually uh, your Grammy-winning album. We'll have that opportunity. Um, we have a, a small green screen uh, film enclosure, so if folks want to come in, and, um, and learn how to do their own videos um, against, uh, against a green screen. Of course, the point of a green screen is, is that it's a blank background that you can then put in whatever background you want against it. So you, uh, our students can take pictures of themselves in the library, or they can take pictures of themselves apparently on the moon, and it will be exciting. Um, we're only beginning now to figure out how all these things go together. Um, we had the opportunity to preview the makerspace for a number of community leaders recently and um, folks were very impressed and then what I loved I think most about that meeting were all the ideas that I hadn't thought of. I had the great privilege of standing next to our juvenile court judge um, in that makerspace and I looked at him and he looked at me and I said so I have an advanced skills acquisition area and you have people who need skills and he said yeah and so part of the fun of this is thinking together about how we're going to use this. Um, Part of pioneering is we don't know exactly where it's going to go yet. Um, what we do know is is that um, uh, the, what I do know is the mayors of several communities have reached out to me, um, and we're trying to talk with the schools. And like I say, we're already talking with the Yellow Springs schools about how we can how we can make all this work. Um, right now, we're just trying to get the space open, and, and we're uh, we're looking forward to that on April 11. Does that address your question? Okay. Okay. What other questions? I just wanted to comment that back on the Virginia Hamilton marker, yes. that the other thing that was really pretty spectacular was having Jamie Adolph, now a teacher, and the Yellow Springs schools with his students there to speak um, at the dedication. That was, um, that's a great, uh, something great. I didn't think anybody could um, replace Aurelia Blake until um, we found Jamie. So mm -hmm. it's great for the schools. It, it, it really it really was beautiful um, to see so many folks of all ages there uh, realizing how powerful something as simple as the written word can be. And uh, as your county librarian, I have to say I'm, uh, it was a pretty exciting day. I was very honored that the state librarian of Ohio chose to attend um, the presentation. She and I have been friends for many years, um, but she has many invitations on any given day. And um, on that day, she felt the most important one was to come out and honor Virginia Hamilton. Because of course, as the uh, keeper of Ohioana, uh, which is an important part of preserving Ohio's literary heritage, uh, Beverly understands only too well uh, how important Virginia Hamilton is, not only to Yellow Springs and Ohio, but to the world. Great. Thanks, right. Carl. Thank you Thanks, very Carl. much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the Energy Board end of year report. Rick? Uh, well, 
thanks, Carl. You're going to be a tough act to follow. <laughs> I, I hope my brevity can match your eloquence. Uh, Rick Walker, Energy Board. Uh, we began the year evaluating which vendor to recommend for the solar power project at Glass Farm. After lengthy interviews and subsequent meetings, we chose Atlas based on their overall cost projections and familiarity with the village. However, as you recall, the village ultimately ended up contracting with American Electric Power, our second choice, after negotiations with Atlas uh, stalled. Last spring, AMP offered a one-time proposal allowing its members the opportunity to realign their power portfolios. The Energy Board recommended the village divest itself of its AMP Fremont Energy Center natural gas contract and replace it with re a renewable resource. The village was subsequently able to purchase a similar amount of power from Brown County's landfill gas operation, increasing the percentage of renewable energy in our portfolio by roughly 7.5%. Uh, last summer, we began a rewrite of the village's solar ordinance. We examined similar ordinances from other communities uh, for guidance. We also considered the Energy Board's possible participation in the Village Climate Action Plan. Although we made no decision on either, we expect to take both of these up again this year. In September, the Energy Board reviewed Efficiency Smart's renewal offer to the Village. Based on the potential efficiency improvements we might realize, Versus the cost of the program, we re recommended the village not renew. Instead, we are seeking alternative ways to, uh, to use our resources more effectively. We are currently working with two companies, Empower Gas and Electric and Go Sustainable Energy, to develop a residential program to make efficiency upgrades easier and more affordable. The model we are considering provides upfront financing with repayment included as part of the monthly residential energy bill. Because the repayment cost would be offset by a reduction in monthly energy costs, there would be no cost increase in the customer's bill. This will be an especially useful tool for upgrading rental properties, uh, offering relief to those most affected by increasing energy costs. Finally, uh, we had two members go off the board this year, Mark Ewalt, moved out of state, and Jerry Papania tendered his resignation after seven years of expert insights and dedication. Uh, we wish to thank them both for their service. We also welcome two new members, Bob Brecka and Franklin Halley, uh, who, by the way, both have solar panels on their homes. Uh, not that that was a consideration. Uh, and lastly, uh, we would like to thank Patty uh, she has been a tireless resource and great to work with. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Questions Thank you. for Rick? Yeah, I, I just want to say I really I like the way you guys are going with the uh, the new program and thinking about affordability. Um, so I'm really impressed by that in particular, and uh, it'll be interesting. We're, to we're see pretty that excited. Happen. More yeah. to come. It's, it's, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Great. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, next item in the agenda, Glass Farm Potential Future Uses Report. And Ken LeBlanc is it, Patty, do you want to introduce? Uh, well, uh, I can, one, I can, you can go ahead. I will introduce Ken LeBlanc. He is the head of Green County Regional Planning. He has been a planner for Long 20 time. years, 30 years, <laughs> 40 years. He was at Green County, he was at MVRPC, I think then at Green County Regional Planning, and then he came back to Green County Regional Planning. And he has gotten that group and that uh, organization really strong and really doing a lot of great work regionally. And um, so when we were kind of going around in circles on, on discussion on Glass Farm, really wanting to see a picture and wanting to understand how all of these uses that we've been talking about are interrelated, um, Patty and I talked about how can we get a quick assessment and plan together and um, it seemed like, like going to Green County Regional Planning was, was a good use of a resource. So uh, Ken did the work, he's here to present and um, 
Um, I assume everybody's already looked at it. So Ken, if you want to, oh, he's got it. Okay. Judy's taking care of that. Um, and I want to thank the village of Yellow Springs for hanging in with us during the, the rough couple years we had at the beginning here when I started. So uh, thanks to you. We've got uh, Fairborn joined in, and so we've got a lot of things going on. Good the job. The commission now. Um, what we looked at, uh, and I, I told them we'd kind of treat this as like a, a zoning case, just we look at all the different factors when we get zoning cases in, we look at everything, transportation, soils, utilities, groundwater, all things like that. So in looking at the location of the site on the west end of town there, you have access to Fairborn area and the Dayton urbanized area from Yellow Springs. Sorry, your, okay. your flash drive is not open enough. Apparently, I don't have one drive. It's not, it for some reason, it's just shouldn't not. shouldn't say one drive. No. You don't have a uh, filter against other flash drives you put in you your system. Shouldn't have. Yes. 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 Hmm. Can you open it under your um, Adobe and see if it'll switch on one drive under that? If Patty's email would have the PDF or report. Um, can you wing it? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Sometimes it helps when you have some pictures to do. Things. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when you, uh, the, the site's in the northwestern corner of the community there. Um, it's on the, on the edge of the built-up area that kind of surrounds it a little bit to the north and some to the south along Dayton. So it's, uh, it's uh, on, the, on the frontier of the village there. And we look at the existing land uses, it's a farm and it's basically been a farm. Um, and then we looked at the zoning and the eastern half is zoned conservation, or not half, but the eastern portion over near the uh, retention pond area. It's zone conservation, and then you have RV zoning in the western portion. So it's already zoned partially for residential. Then we looked at the public plans, the village comprehensive plan in 2010 and the county plan in 2001. We looked at those two plans to see what they said about it. And the uh, village plan mentions uh, is expected to be residential with various densities. Uh, consistent with the existing subdivisions in the area um, and those include Park Meadows of high density, Kingsfield low density, Stancliff neighborhood medium high and uh, Thistle Creek which is medium high so that's what's surrounding it um, and the eastern third that mentioned was taken off for the conservation area and that's as I understand a stormwater problem that was occurring and the village constructed the uh, retention pond there to slow the water off and, and reduce the impact of the water running on the properties to the northeast. Um, the the, the uh, city uh, or the village plan says that there are sewer available um, from the King Street up there, the King's, King Street and the uh, crossing there just to the southeast of the property. And it uh, the detention pond was not intended to accommodate any new development, so that was not to be used for a, a detention pond with any new development coming in. They would have to provide their own. 
And then also it call, calls for extensions from Wright Street and Kenneth and Hamilton Way, eventually winding up into the property from the south. And an extension over into East Eden Road from the west end of the property, eventually, in the long term. So there's there's a number of things that we looked at in the county in the county plan as well. From the county perspective, this is uh, on the edge and in the urban area of Yellow Springs. So we have encouraged development in those kind of areas. And we would not want anything that went on this farm to be spread out over the farm acreage out in the rural part of the county eating up farmland. The utilities, as I mentioned, there's a uh, six and four inch uh, main along Yellow Springs Fairfield. There is a constriction that reduces the pressure in Ridgecrest uh, Heights over there, Ridgecrest area, um, from the supply line along Yellow Springs, Fairfield Road, Fairfield Pike, and the village. And then Dayton Street has uh, water supply that comes up to King, uh, up King Street into the edge of the property there. So it, you get the possibility to loop the water around and improve the water pressure in the Ridgecrest area uh, if there's development on this uh, property to go through there. Um, it's in within the facility planning area of Yellow Springs, so it'll be your sewer. And the sewer is available, as I mentioned, down at King's uh, High Street and King Street at the southeast corner of the property. King. And the uh, High Street? I'm sorry, right. No. Dayton's? No, it comes up. It comes up. So the property of the, the street on the right. That's why I needed that. King Street. King Street. The report shows that if the, the sewer is available down here, and then with the improvements you guys made to the Dayton sewer, then this, this would be the way you'd sewer the property into the southeast. And then eventually, long term, you, if you built it right, it would be available to sewer anything out to East Eden Road. The major thoroughfare access for the, actually the property touches would be Yellow Springs uh, Fairfield Road out to the north. But there's a, a possible site distance problem to the east when you, if you put a road connection out there. We wanted the county engineer, we suggest that you have them look at that um, to see if the speed limit needs to be lowered if you would ha have the access out at that point or if it would be able to handle site distance parameters uh, with the speed limit as it is now or what that would have to take into account. Um, we said the property is seven tenths of a mile from the downtown and the CBE. It's pretty much, uh, if, you, if you're walking and biking, it's about equal distance to, from each. So you would, you would be able to, it's within a mile, so you could bike or hike or walk downtown or to the CBE. And there is a proposed north-south path along King Street for bicycle use eventually, as I mentioned in the plan before. And the long-range uh, bikeway and pedestrian projects from MVRPC include a Fairborn Yellow Springs Cedarville connector trail along Fairfield uh, Yellow Springs Road. So that would have access to a regional trail in the future as well. So there's a lot of things going for this property. One of the things we had in the county thoroughfare plan was to connect Ridgecrest down um, to Wright Street, and that was mentioned as a possible collector up through the village uh, through there, but we don't really recommend running in, into a residentially local design street on, on Ridgecrest there. So eventually we would suggest that if there's some kind of an access, it would go to the west and then up either through that little arm of the property that's at the west end or if the property in the middle wants to develop a long time uh, along with this property or sometime near that then it could come up through there. Wait, Excuse where? Me. Yeah. Ken, Ken, so are you... I'm looking at this map right here. Right, yeah. I, I, right. So in the county plan, which was done in 1987 and we're updating it now, it mentioned to take 
Wright Street and directly connected up to Ridgecrest. So, and so are you saying that given that uh, Ridgecrest is a res residential area, better not to have a more traffic going through there that that, yeah. that old plan would have possibly right. created? Because it's possible to run it out either through east, east through the property eventually, or but or you could run it out to King, you know, come up and come, go over to King Street and come up as well. And those were your those were your Kim, village right? connections. This is Kim. But just as I think, with the way Ridgecrest was, I don't think it was designed to take part of that. And you'd have to go through residential neighborhood, maybe take property to make it a collector standard type of street. It's, you could have a connection in there, and I'll go over that. The connection from the network in the property to out there is very good, uh -huh. but not a through, right. through way. Then the, the village had a so can we just then? pull up the maps from the oh. packet? Good. So we at least got that. Did the email thing work? Is that what it was? Yeah. Okay. I'm no, still trying were, to get your you flash drive. She was there. I'm oh, okay. having any luck. Okay. Maybe it's because it's it. on our county system. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what we were talking about. So the red line was the proposed connector. The kind of curved red line? Yes. Mm -hmm. Coming through the center, okay. Yeah. Okay, then uh, go on, scroll up a little bit there, or down, I guess. I was told I'd pull off the different. <laughs> Yeah, there's the soil map, okay. Um, so on that map, the soils and, and the village had a, a geotechnical report done on the soil, with the soils on the property to find out what kind of conditions were on there. And their report mentioned that uh, the soil suitability for earthwork and designing construction of foundations and floor slabs and things like that. Um, the soils are not the, the best for that. I mean, they're not bad soils, but they're not going to support heavy duty giant buildings, uh, McMansions and things like that. We're talking smaller type of housing on slabs and they did not mention basements. So what the soils are in the area, they're clays that are really wet and they tend to what they call shrink swell and move. And if, so if you put foundations in there, they'll, um, they'll move. And so when you're talking about smaller houses, give us a square footage. Well, there's no, there was no direct. But what would you, I mean, I'm not, this is just a proposal, but what, right. well, when you not, think of smaller well, houses. we're probably not talking the 3,000 square foot or 2,500 like, square foot houses we're building Under 2,000 square feet, is that? Fair. Probably something along that line, yeah. More along your traditional sizes that were built, say the subdivisions of the 60s and so forth. So somewhere between 15, 12 to 1500 and 2000. Yeah, somewhere in that. Actually, the smaller, that neighborhood is smaller. But so your neighbor. Wood Ridge Crest, between 1000 and 12. Those, were the, those were the earlier ones, yeah. Right. Probably in the late 40s, early 50s, uh -huh. yeah. And was there wasn't there a mention met in the in the geotechnical report about second stories may not be advisable either? Yeah, because you're going to have you right. have to the weight the pound down and, and support that weight because if the buildings are too heavy on these kind of soils, that's really going to help with all that. Is as I mentioned to somebody, you can you can technically do anything. St. Petersburg, yeah. Russia was built on a swamp. Yeah, it's Chicago is the same way. But, you know, we're not doing that in Yellow Springs. So. Well, uh, the reason I, uh, I, I mean, I had a question about that because, like, uh, Wright Street in the village, um, that used to be called uh, Frogtown, I believe, because that was a very wet area. Well, there's just normal size and often two-story houses there. So I wondered, you know, is there a way that they're able to, you know, is this really different than other parts of the village? No, I would say it's... It's probably similar yeah, to some of that. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the, the reason I ask is because there are two-story houses there. I mean, they're not yeah, huge we're houses. Not giant. They're not giant, but they are two-story. Yeah. yeah. Well, it would be nice to have more flexibility. I feel, you know, you know, not to be limited to yeah, like a ranch style. Yeah, but you're going to have to have, you know, talk to a developer about the end. yes, an engineers okay. about all that. I'm right. Not, right. And right. it's also about cost too. Yeah. Because the more 
the more work that has to be right. done to no, stabilize the foundation yeah, no, and to yeah. amend the soils, it's just going to make the housing more expensive. But, well, I, along those lines, I see you have soil types for beyond the glass farm. So mm -hmm. I guess that's available to the county. Yeah, we took uh, the county soil maps. If you look on the Green County GIS, you can pull up soil oh, maps. Oh, cool. So like Park Meadows, for example, which isn't that far away, I, I mean, it's not really showing. Well, it's showing a little bit of. Where's that down in the park. southeast? Yeah. Yeah. The green is the Miamian, which are uh, Miamian, the MH, B2, and B are, are kind of better soils. The Brookston are very wet, and they're going to be harder to deal with because part of the report also said you have to get water away from the foundations. So it's, it's, it's not showing Park Meadows, actually, but at any rate, my question is leading to Park Meadows is attached con uh, condo, and um, so it seems like they're – soil type probably isn't that much different from the glass farm so no most of the western part of the town is is pretty much the same kind of soils around here but when you get into the, the blue you know the brookstons and, and things like that the crosby's the orange you have to drain it away a little more the brookstons are really a lot more wet and you can see that's the part of the site that the d retention ponds on right. and those are the, where you kind of see the depressions leading into it mm -hmm. so that's what you want to kind of stay away with from development if you're going to design something in there. Uh, can I just ask you on the the um, the, no the uh, neighborhood to the to the north that's all yellow, and it's did they did they build it to be? Yes, that's that's MRB. That's Miami and soils that have been disturbed. When they went and did the soil survey, they went down five feet and they took the soil profile and rated it for all kinds of things. But in areas that were already built when they did the soil survey, they usually have an R after it, and that just means the bulldozers have been in to do the subdivision and mixed everything up. So all, pretty much all developed areas, you know, have most of Beaver Creek, the developed part of Xenia, the developed part of Fairborn, and the developed part of the village, the older section, is going to do these R soils, which are just, they call them disturbed soils. So Miami is the it, but, parent but, soil, but it's been messed. You know, okay, messed around, but. but the um, just to understand that little graph, you know, the little colored graph about yeah. the different soils, it's showing it as uh, maybe more builder friendly or something like no, that. No, this that doesn't that? mean builder friendly. This was just to, to okay. The soil it's types. okay. Gotcha. Well, I think you need to reiterate the. Because so it was you're hearing it like I heard it. Okay. You're going to have to get the experts in to determine yeah. what kind of housing you want to put. Yeah. Want to put. <laughs> yeah. I just this thought it was funny because the soil like was very yeah. square. Yeah. To when we look at sites so, on the general yeah, planning like aspect, okay. you know, we look at these soils to kind of, you know, it tells where the wet areas are and the higher right. areas. But it, but on the county map, we can actually see. Oh yeah. The whole area. Yeah, and on okay. the regional planning commission, we're working toward having awesome. a map set where you can see this over the whole county. Right. Okay, the next section on the water and drainage. Go down to the next map, Judy. So the, uh, the blue area is the drainage area that goes northwest. There's kind of a, a smaller divide, and as I understand, everything there goes up to the Mud Creek. Everything in white is going to go to the southeast, and a lot of it through the pond, and go eventually around town and into the Little Miami River. So that's where kind of a, a, a natural drainage break is on the property. Is that a lot of space for that little creek? The white, the white section. Well, it's it's going to drain if, if the water comes from the south and it's already been developed and probably there's storm drains already emptying yeah. and everything. Right. So so the, the area to the west of the pond up to the blue line is going to naturally drain into that so any development that would have to occur what we're talking about in the recommendations is is to make sure that we calm the storm water down before it even gets to the pond so we're not blowing it into the pond flooding everything downstream again in fact ken what you mentioned about that where that comes from, the area already being developed, a lot of it comes from underground aquifers and springs that were 
that were developed around with drainage built in. Yeah. And that's where a lot of that comes from. And that's typical of every urban area, too. What does that um, creek actually go to after it goes under Dayton Street? Where does it go? Where is it at? Uh, no, it's flowing out of Dayton Street. It's, it's, it's goes it's into the glen. You're asking what, what's feeding into it from south of Dayton Street? Oh, so yeah, it goes that way. I'm sorry. No, yeah. it doesn't go this way. It's going right, north. Right, right, right. So okay, so my question was, should well, have been, where's it coming from? So where's it going to? Well, it's it's part of the village between Dayton Street and further south. I'm, I'm not sure where the exact break is, but it's all that developed area of the village uh -huh. that's draining into that. Okay, oh, I got this morning. Down, down around, well, down around well, Omar well, and Gaunt Park. Park in that area so is where it's coming from. I just, it just, you know, you follow the stream as a kid. And then it disappears? Well, when we didn't know where it went, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> not unless you're like we were and used to crawl through the tunnels well, to see did. where they popped out. Said, yeah. You know, it was like... Virtually, we all made it back out. <laughs> so we came down, to, uh, and that's pretty much the groundwater. It's the water comes from the aquifer. So this this is not rated a very highly vulnerable area to water groundwater pollution. And that you're going to really talk about more of that when you're talking about industrial. You know, you're worried more about that when you're doing industrial commercial stuff with, with chemicals that can spill in, like. Dayton was doing with their well field protection program and you guys did with yours. Um, so we've got the recommendations of this after looking at all the factors. Um, so we, we see the existing uh, residential zoning and, and that could be tweaked a little bit if you want, but that's, that's appropriate for the area. Smaller homes without basements are recommended and the size and bulk of the structures should be compatible with the soil conditions precluding larger structures. Um, in the southwest part of the property, um, Judy, can you roll down to the map while we're talking about all this? Then we can put these out. Yeah. So we got this. You can keep talking because. Oh, okay. Well, I was, first thing was about the southwest part of the site. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> you have that up. Well, uh, yeah. It's apparently not going to shrink, so. That's all right. It just needs to come back. Yeah. It's it is not the night for electronics. <laughs> not even a full moon. Oh. I'm just going to start over. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the southwest is is the planned solar array field so you know that's going to pretty much stay there in the plan and then we say the main access should be to king well Street. Patrick, and just on that one ken yes. so you said that it should stay there and it should stay there is that an assessment based on soil or what no it's just you guys have done okay. a study for it so gotcha. we didn't want to go any further than that okay so there we are with that and then we're talking about the main access uh, to start off with would be the the access on the east side there to king street so that would come in about where you see the little drive now between the pond the conservation area and the easement and so forth and the north property line would come in and then it should curve to the south a little bit so when you bring ridgecrest down you can put some lots against the existing houses and, and build it that way um, and a 60 foot right away and that would be accommodate a possible turn lane and pedestrian bike facilities and you'd have to and they come in for the development of the property as a whole and decide how many units you're talking about then you'd look at your traffic and decide whether you need a turn lane coming in and out of that onto king street so you were just saying houses all the way at the northern border and then the, and then the road going in so you're talking about houses on both sides potentially well, that's if you're going to get your money out of your road, right. you want to do that, yeah. But because of that conservation easement in the pond, you want you get to start up and then curve back. Mm -hmm. in. And that's a common design in a lot of subdivisions. Okay. Well, since you said that, I really have an issue with that. Um, Patty, Patty, let's keep it at council table, and Fine. and we'll get we'll get to you. Fine. Okay, then uh, Ridgecrest Drive, we were suggesting extended into the property to meet the proposed entrance off of uh, King Street. We said that. Uh, and then access should not be part of any continuous north-south 
um, to minimize traffic on the existing ridge crest and keep the options open for potential future access via Wright Street, Kenneth and Hamilton Way uh, to the property via to the south. And these would, be would have to be waited to be incorporated into any development proposals okay. if they occur south on those properties. And so I think it's the Kinney Farm and there's another property down there. So, and that all depends on the owners of that, those properties on when and if they ever want to develop those. But, Designing this should keep those available. You don't want to take that option out because the more little connections you have and in interconnectedness, I think somebody talked about that earlier in the meeting, the more interconnected you have, the more a better neighborhood you have instead of everybody being in their own little isolated uh, enclave. Um, road access uh, out to Yellow Springs Fairfield Road, we said to the northwest corner and we recommend the county engineer look at that. Um, the future right. road, at, now, what may, may happen after there is if you want that, if he says there's a problem, that the little ridge there may be, have to shake off a little mm -hmm. bit to get the right, so you've got to balance the cost of that versus then maybe the properties to the north would want to develop when they hear this is going on and they could bring it out higher straight up that way too. Um, future road access out to East Eden Road via the access point north of the solar array should be incorporated. So you want, you want to be able to plan for the future to take it out to the west as well. And that would give you, eventually, if everything develops in there, you've got access east-west between King Street and Eden. That's the East Eden. And then poor natural drainage uh, and the capa limited capacity of the pond to accept additional stormwater. Uh, the property should de be designed with its own separate retention detention areas and two possible locations that might be considered are shown on the map. So we've got a blue dot west of the pond and we have another blue dot because of the drainage break you can want one before it leaves the property to the west. <coughs> um, existing retention pond should be included in the conservation easement and I think that's being looked at uh, and similar protection to ensure it remains functioning as planned. And then drainage on the eastern part of the site should be managed in both rate and qual uh, quality to ensure protection of the existing pond. Rain gardens and other green infrastructure management techniques should be used on the home sites and along drainage routes to minimize impacts on flow and water quality. Everyone know what rain gardens are? Yeah. Okay. My other slides that were on there, I showed there was a development, uh, and I can email it to you, uh, in uh, British Columbia outside of Vancouver that an engineering firm has some examples of how they design that subdivision with some rain gardens in it. And they could be, you know, between the houses or they could be along the streets um, and that would be just up to whoever's designing the subdivision how they want to do that. And they could be incorporated into some kind of walking paths or, you know, green infrastructure through the, through the development. And we gave you three links there that you can look up. I know Columbus is really starting on this also, the rain garden concept. And then the western part of the site flows uh, just north of the solar array. And again, we're recommending the same thing. You could do a rain gardens on the east side of the solar array. So any development then would drain into that and then up to the pond and out. And then uh, it should be pedestrian and bike friendly internally and, and with connections coming out at all those points. And a connection to King Street through the southern part, you might, you might want to look at that. That's the purple line in there. You might want to look at that just because it cuts a little bit off of the trip if you're going downtown. Instead of coming straight out and going down King, if you're developing the southern part of the property, they could go straight out there. And so, Ken, it was hard for me to read that. So is that purple line, as you described it, that's on the south, I guess, southwest? No, southeast. southeast, yeah, that's, and then is it going down of King comes. Street? Yeah, yeah, that, that so was like, uh, eventually. I think you, the plan you guys had a plan that talked about having a side path along King or something yeah. in your in your village wide, mm -hmm. like pedestrian. Okay. It's a shared roadway. Like, yeah, shared roadway. Some kind of a system where the bikes are given a lot of notice and so forth. Along with the and how would you get to that bike path? The, uh, the part from, that from, from the, the development? development? Yes. I mean, how would you get it from here? Yeah, from yeah. here. Well, I didn't, we didn't want to show that. anything. You could just 
design this however you wanted it, just so there's you know, best people yeah. can access this and come out to King Street. <laughs> We're not, I'm not giving you any kind of specific design on that. Okay. One of, one of the questions that Ken asked me during the, our discussions when he was working on the report was about um, pedestrian and bicycle access through the conservation area. And one of the things that had come up in discussions at the Environmental Commission was how to connect that, the, this part over here, the glass farm, to where the sidewalk stops at, on King Street and make it accessible. Mm -hmm. Well, the only way to do that through the conservation area is with an undeveloped trail because you can't put a paved path, correct, Krista? So therefore, if you make it an undeveloped trail, you can walk over it or you can ride or walk your bicycle down to the sidewalk on King Street and it gives you access into the glass farm through the wetland and on back into the development that way it takes a few hundred feet off your walk if you're going down right. or so. unless you accept that area out of the conservation easement um if you unless you do that before we pass the conservation yeah. easement correct and see how planning is all work together <laughs> yes um and so in the northeastern part of the glass farm where you have the where you show the road yes. coming out to king street um how much space at that very northeastern corner do you think needs to be there? I, w I wouldn't leave any less than 60. That gives you the possibility if you do need that turn lane. So and a 60 foot right away would give you a lane in, a lane out, a possible turn lane, and then you would have sidewalks or bike path. And then you, sh you show the, the road sort of drifting south a bit yeah so that if that were to happen then that that's even bigger than that's more than 60. but, but when you widen it then if you're putting residential homes in there then you'd have to leave enough room for a lot yeah i'm asking that because it it's not clear exactly where the how the easement is going to go but at this point or most recently we were talking about having a line straight basically east west so the, this would this is showing more of a curve well, the, the road can go as far to the end of the easement that's necessary for the grant yeah. and then curve in this is just i think a guess this is conceptual so, yeah i mean it's you not you guys have to decide which you know how many feet exactly i i know but given that this is on the table yeah. and we okay. haven't done the easement yet we want to make sure that we <coughs> have the up. easement matches the as much your much idea as possible yeah. Mm -hmm. right yeah i yep. think we left we left 60 feet to begin with on on that side on the north side and um if, if, when i was corresponding with michelle earlier in the week um about having it resurveyed um we were just going to square it up like we had talked the day that we were out there walking mm -hmm. um, with uh, michelle and krista and, and, and ted and Maybe I wasn't there. But we were, yeah, we were just going to kind of square it up and... Yeah, and it's not that, so my, what I'm really concerned about is not the northeastern part of the easement, but the northwestern part of the easement. Because this picture shows it curving around and that's not how we were going to have it. So if we are going to allow for the possibility of a road to drop down so there could be houses above it, Ooh. then we might want to re-examine the easement yeah. Yeah. we just we just want to make sure by the time it gets to ridge crest you have enough so you don't have a really sharp curve mm -hmm. you come straight in you don't want to bring it all in and do that which is well, it was kind of where we had it coming was right yeah. to the south sidewalk the i'm sorry the far east sidewalk right of way um on ridge crest, on ridge crest. yeah and if you can do that and it um, can, came in and then it was curving down and moving yeah. I mean, if you if you want to do it, that that's fine. But then you could build another house at the intersection of Ridgecrest if you wanted to in the, in the development. Right. So it's, which it's would fine. seem to make sense if we were going to have that access. So you'd want 150 feet or so. We wouldn't have. To, it depends on what size housing and lot you want up there. Um, it's just so that all, all those people don't have a street right up to their backyard, so they got, their house has a street yes. in the front and the back as well. So. Right. I'm just showing you some typical ideas that we run across. 
And that's pretty much it. I mean, if you have any other questions, I think we try to give you some ideas and juice stuff. Has Planning Commission seen this? No. Do you think they should, Jerry? Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, I guess I'm wondering, so what is the process of how we go forward with this? And um, something I've been thinking is that it seems like at some point, and I don't know what needs to happen before then, we should be um, asking for proposals. I was just going to say that I think we're at the point. I think we we know we, cannot, we know we, we want housing. Yeah. I mean, I think I think we're pretty clear on what we so, want here, and we need to just put out an, a development RFP or RFQ something because well, we have we're to figure out what do we want there. I mean, is is it all affordable? If it's not all affordable housing, then the council needs to describe, you know, what we want. I think we can. I guess I don't think we should be as quite as prescriptive. I think maybe we should we should talk about housing. We should talk about values around affordable housing, and um, you know maybe make it a little bit more values based and see what people come back with. I I, sir, I personally would like to see a mix of housing. I would I would like to see um, and and potentially multifamily. I mean I know that's going to be. A little difficult with um, be with the, be, with the sizing, but but that's why I, I really think I would like to look, you know, at at a at a design or a development proposal. But I don't think it's fair to developers to not give any guidelines. I mean, to just throw it out there, uh, personally. Oh, I, I mean, I think I think. So I think that you know maybe we need to have a conversation or two about what we want to see to say, yeah, we want some affordable housing, but be real vague about it. Seems to me, I don't know. That's my sense that we should be more specific than that but um but yeah then open the door to see what people come forward with but i know um i was talking to denise earlier about uh just you know going over the proposals we had to look at today and um the whole the housing study came up and i believe that is a goal of the council this year and i'm wondering where how the time frame is in terms of that because it strikes me you know i had mentioned when we were talking about goals how how can we use Denise, our part-time staff person, um, and I don't know what her time, you know, her time uh, availability is, but it seems like that is a very high priority of the council. And if we're thinking about putting out an RFP or whatever you call it uh, on the glass farm, it seems like we should be doing that, like pronto. And if Denise can play a role in helping that go forward, because I know Patty's got her hands full of 55 other things or if, if uh, Denise can be helpful I think we should we should make that happen well a housing needs assessment would certainly be a great attachment to go along with an RFP you, to show a developer what the opportunities are and what the needs are um, my recollection is is that is that um, Emily Seibel came up with a pretty good laundry list of what a uh, what a housing needs assessment should look like okay. yeah and I was talking to Emily today about that and maybe we can just pull that out for the next meeting and staff if Patty maybe, maybe you could put some some thoughts together look at what Emily yeah, although you're not going to have a lot of time I know so this is not good what, timing for yeah, you. yeah I mean Patty's about to go uh, surgery yeah. um, well, one of the one Denise, of the things what, that you uh, can think about is um, you can say that it can be developed in X percent of the housing needs to be yeah income. that's fine I just think that, we need to and well we might want it we may have I think we should have a conversation at least one or two about so, you know our the density we want to see but are you so, saying we need the housing needs assessment that's what you're I'm saying. saying. Yeah, that's a, yes. I, I think you. But I think if we, when we get to that RFP thing, right. so we right. would. Yeah. Okay. But that's kind of a discrete thing that um, I would think we would have somebody else do. We would need to have a consultant do a housing needs assessment. Yeah, absolutely. But right. but somebody staff needs to be involved. Right. right. Uh, because I, I think it's important that we look at the 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 zoning code, the new zoning code, which has really loosened up and allowed for more density um, and what we have existing I mean what could we build out to be not expanding our borders we have a lot of property that hasn't been developed we've had a lot of development that's happened since and more and more people are starting to split off lots they realize they can do this now with the zoning code and we're getting more 
I mean, we probably had 40, 45, <coughs> 45 single family units built since 2010. Um, so that being said, there's still a lot of properties that have not been developed at all. You have the Glass Farm, you have the Kinney property, you have uh, behind the, the Mexican restaurant, there's a big chunk of land. There's a chunk of land adjacent to uh, Thistle Creek. Um, there's, there's some development there over at Antioch. I know we, at Antioch is looking to do, as they still are, I mean, they're looking anywhere from yeah. 290 to 340 yeah. units. So I think we're taking to the existing zoning code, and we and, and planning commission has been looking at the concept of a pocket neighborhood development, which would the glass farm would be really great for something like that because it's small, it's more cluster housing. So you have a common open space area and smaller homes around a common area that would be interesting. But all that being said, I I don't know where we want to go. I mean, and at some point we have a you know, do you want to be more than a village? because I think that we have enough property within the village that we could definitely surpass that 5,000 mark. I agree. Taking into consideration too, we have accessory dwelling units that are allowed now on every, on every property. Do you, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> well, well also, I mean, one of the factors is how fast we grow out, which I think we don't, I, I mean, I personally don't want to see us putting in 50 homes a year or something like that. That seems too fast. Mm -hmm. but, but what I actually wanted to say was, I think we need to decide how to involve the community because we, or I anyway, have talked about having public involvement in thinking about this. But, but I think a housing needs assessment is kind of a discrete thing that yeah, we I'm, probably need to move yeah, on I because we're going to have to write an RFP, we're going to have to put it out and wait for proposals to come back. So that's probably something that um, we need to move on. But I think in terms of, I mean, I think uh, we do want to have public involvement, but I also think we want a process that does not languish for months and years and all this kind of thing. So I think how that, what, where the public weighs in, um, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think, I know you did too. We've been talking about development of the glass farm into housing for years and we all ran on that most of us did if not all of us uh, so we were elected on that idea so I don't think the the question of whether we're going to do it should uh, should that that's not the place where we want input so figuring out where should we get the public input in a way in a, you know and and how where is that relative to an RFP the this the um, you know asking for uh, that which I know so and then having a time frame this year like when you know when do we want to have the housing needs assessment done and sort of I, it seems like if we could have some plan of then then there's going to be you know just you know taking that input discussion and then uh, leaving of, of the RFP mm -hmm. something like that well, and that we should have some time frames it, attached to that what's your what's your um, the amount of money you can spend without thirty thousand without without a bid or does I can do thirty thousand without a bid I generally don't like. I, I guess my point is though that that we could task Patty. I don't I hope a housing needs assessment is not going to cost that much money. That we could rather than put out an RFP just to get a housing needs assessment, we could task Patty and Denise with finding a company to do a housing, a consultant to do a housing needs assessment and get moving on that. What, what I'd like to suggest if you want to go that route is I think we can probably find three companies to give us proposals just like any other bid okay. and then we choose from those three. Um, the lowest bid provided it is the best bid that meets our needs. Um, there are different ways of doing housing needs assessment and they can be um, more more in depth or less in depth mm -hmm. and Emily I think does have some yeah, knowledge and a relationship with a company that she's worked with too so well, that could be easily I would like to get involved in yeah, because yeah. I, I, I don't and, want it to just be what 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 is already existing I right. want to I really we need to look at what could, lots and what else. could happen as a result of the zoning code in our future and is that something we really want it may it may make us say Oh, well, maybe in RA we're going to want to limit some more of some of the things that we're doing maybe in RB or RC. I don't know, but I think that we need to 
future it a bit. Yeah, I think I think Marianne that you would definitely be one of the people that needed to be involved in that, maybe with myself and Denise, and perhaps we can come up with what we and, want and, and get that proposal. So when I was through. talking with Emily today and we also talked about involving Susan Stiles mm -hmm. because she has a pretty good housing expertise too. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So I think this all sounds really great, Denise. I particularly appreciate that you're thinking about, you know, the whole village and not just this property and making these decisions. But I guess I want to bring it back to the conservation easement because I feel like no matter what timelines we set down, this is going to take some time. And so I wonder, you know, how close are we with a plan or diagram like this to start to figure out where the conservation easement, you know, can be? Yeah. Krista, can you tell me if Michelle met with Lou yet this week? Um, actually, we wanted to delay it to last week. Okay. So we wanted to make sure that we were drawing the survey lines right. really <laughs> to, to have them. So which I'm glad that we did. Uh, but yeah, we should be able to get together with them pretty soon. That's, you're talking about the surveyor? Yeah. yeah. Can yeah. you come up and explain to us where we are in the process? Okay, sure. Um, there's, there's just been a lot that we didn't understand up front about kind of what e exactly was required as far as zoning and just to see this whole picture. And so I really appreciate being able to, to look at this material for the meeting tonight. Um, and um, so we, I, I think we can work with this. We have got actually some more invasive removal that, that we're, we should do soon. Mm -hmm. And we're at a point where OPWC may say to us fairly soon that we shouldn't spend any more money until we get the conservation easement done. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I would really love to be able to have the go ahead, you know, within the next few weeks. I mean, even the next well, meeting, if that were possible. So I, could somebody explain to me what the holdup is? I, I, what, what are the concerns? The, the concern is they, the council will not, you mean on the easement itself? Yes. Or um, OPWC will not allow them to spend any more money. I understand that. Why but aren't we able to come up with a decision? Well, we, have to, we have to finalize a survey. Okay. And this drawing was not available whenever we, we had the survey done before. Plus, the surveyor actually made a mistake mm -hmm. on one area, one critical area as far as really getting the tip of the creek up on the, uh, the western edge. Um, and so, so we need to get that corrected, but we didn't want to get it corrected without knowing where right. the right. boundaries would be. The other thing we just talked about tonight was, right, this vision that was going to be like 60 foot straight across. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, if we're looking at something like this, maybe that's not going to work. It, I, so what, that squeezes down, mm -hmm. you know, from the, the north end. What I, what I would like to recommend to council, um, you know, if we choose at the end of the day to not grant a conservation easement, we're going to have to repay the money that has already been spent out of the grant, correct? So um, at this point, there has been so much invasives removal that it seems a shame that we would stop removing the invasives. Yeah. So I would suggest to council that we say to Krista, that you know to go ahead and continue removing the invasives while we complete the survey and bring it back because at the end of the day if if we don't pass the easement we're going to pay for the invasives removal anyway and i'd hate to waste the money by not finishing that job well i, I get the question i have is does the placement of the road am i understanding the road coming out on King Street potentially could affect the conservation easement? Yeah, there, I, I think Mary Ann was asking some mm -hmm. questions well, about well, that earlier. As yeah. far as See, we've sloping. allowed for the 60, right. or we oh, so will, okay. it will allow for the 60 okay. feet. But what we didn't allow for, I'm was not that exactly curve down to the about that curve, allowing curve. it to sort of curve yeah. down. It would just reshape the survey a little bit. Yeah, but you think I mean, it's doable. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. There's no well, problem that's why I, doing but, it. And that's what I think we need to figure out is, Maybe. I mean, do we in principle think this kind of plan or, you know, this I mean, we should structure. make the space for it. Why don't we make the space for it? I mean, it? I think we can do that. Just, then, to, yeah. just to follow up on Patty's comment. Unless there's some problem. The, the, it would be possible for the village to pay for the next three, four thousand dollars of honeysuckle work. And get reimbursed. And get reimbursed at the mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. If if to keep the project rolling, 
but to make sure that we've got a legal that everybody's going to be comfortable with, legal description mm -hmm. uh -huh. on, the, on the easement. I don't think that the terms of the easement are, are an issue. It, we've, we've worked with your attorneys on the, right. the Yellow Springs Creek easement, so I think we've got all that down. But we, we do have to have a legal description that everybody is comfortable with before we record the easement. Oh, okay, I, I don't want to upset any apple cart here, but is now that we're really talking about developing this area, is there a potential downside to putting a conservation easement on it before we have a, a development plan? Are we locking ourselves in to something that we may wish we weren't locking ourselves into? Well, you know, for most of the area, of the conservation easement, there would be no development there. Right. I mean, it's not. It's not developed. It's not developed. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that's yeah. yeah. If I could just suggest a, an upside is you would be talking to new homeowners about a home next to a permanently preserved natural area, which would increase the values. True. Of the homes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems. It looks to me like. Um, we could just give ourselves the space yeah. to and just leave it at that, right? Yeah. I don't see any problem at all. We just okay. need to have the and dimensions we, we can that decide we later. Need okay. and and where the they are. Conservation easement and just make space for help some flexibility. I'd like to speak on that curve. I mean, it's not. Yeah, we'll, we're, we'll still give citizens a yeah. chance. Yeah. Um, go yeah. ahead. We're, I guess, I think we're at a stopping point. Because he brought that was the reason that um because it appears that um whether that's we'll just say where it's at on king street is 60 feet and then curves southward another 30 feet or whatever it is um if you're going to straighten it out bring the king street more southern so it's not 60 feet but into my property because it looks to me like you're going around community gardens that's what i saw when i first saw it so i was just kind of asking well i i don't know that these are going to remain as community gardens i mean this this land is being developed yeah. so i don't know that what's there is right. going yeah. to stay are you going to develop on that on that king street road entrance as well also well, well it's going to be a road. that's what ken was well, saying yeah. was that the north part and i'm not tall enough but sure. north of <laughs> <laughs> North of the road, there would be houses. Yes, so there would be like where Bettina lives. There would be a house backyard to backyard. Yes, not not necessarily at the end where the road comes in where you live, but. And you have yes. to engineer that out to whatever the depth of the lots were going to be. Whatever you decide the depth of the right. lots were going to be. And the, and the other way you could bring it in here it would come down, but but the ridge crest would have to maybe curve. So you'd have a, a 90 degree intersection right. there. Mm -hmm. But but the idea is, you know, originally was to bring it down so you'd have a row of lots. So you have, the there's enough space there? And that, for you've got to remember houses. that's markers and that's all the conceptual. But, yeah. it, it may not, number of feet <coughs> wise, it may not be totally that far down. So Right. And that's just put in there to be a, a conceptual. Yeah visual representation it's not measured out to scale continue but i'm not done <laughs> well what what else do you have to say um just from looking at that particular mat because i don't know your plans because we didn't don't know. have any yet Patty. okay but you have a, a conceptual as you said as more houses if that road off of king street you're going to put houses in that general area before Ridgecrest, is that what I'm hearing? Well, that's, it's, it's possible. It's, it's possible. possible, but the final plan but develop the final depends plan. on what developer is chosen right. and what the village at the end of the day. There, that's several discussions down right. the road. Because some of my comments are, if, if that's a road, then you know yeah. I was suggesting that uh, sound barriers or something. But if houses go in, forget that comment. The only yeah, the only thing we really. From a, from a permanent standpoint, the only thing that we need to, to worry about is the area of that easement. That's what we right. need. Everything else is conceptual. Nothing else is is, is cast in stone, and, and there really isn't anything else to talk about until um, there is a more more of a development plan. Right. 
probably part of your RFP or whatever it might be if, if a buffering against anything to the north that would be against the road. Maybe, maybe there could be evergreens planted or a wall or something put in against Okay, the so I could hold off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Three hours to be held off again. <laughs> Thank you. Bettina. Hi, Bettina Stolzenberg. I do recognize that it is conceptual, but I'm curious to know if the road from King Street to Meet Ridgecrest would be affected by the fact that that entire square, or rectangle rather, is zoned conservation. Does that affect a road going in there nothing zone conservation yet yeah well, it's not well, the zone. It's zone, it's zone but, conservation, but, the but that's it's in the zoning yeah. yeah that can be changed that can be changed okay yeah maybe builds on, on both of those and I have caught parts of the previous conversation but is there any inherent reason other than that's been in previous discussions why there would need to be a primary access from King Street a new primary access from King Street it seems like there are viable other connections uh, depending on how you'd like to imagine this area developed I'm not saying yes or no but it doesn't seem a given at this point just looking at what I've seen well, I, I said yeah. primary because right now, if you start to develop and you're going to develop the eastern part, that's the, really the only way in and out. Unless you run everybody through Ridgecrest. Which, you know, started that way back in the day. Right. So, um, but it's the initial access. It just, to me, it's the connectivity to, the, you know, mm -hmm. to the rest of the village. If, if there's that corner, is, you can't connect till it comes all, I don't know. Right, I, I, I feel like it's... I think that there does need to be connection from King Street, but... Um, but, we, but again, we, we've, we've agreed that we just need to think about the conservation as mm -hmm. easement, and a lot of this planning, I mean, we want to have that public process piece. So we just need right now to figure out what space do we not want to put an easement on. Mm -hmm. um, so do we have that? I mean, are uh, well, I actually just texted Krista, but she might not have her phone, that says, <laughs> can we walk the glass farm on Friday? Um, so um, how about if we walk the glass farm and figure that out, and um, it'll be in the packets for council, uh, at least a representation, uh, okay. the next packet for council. Yeah. Sounds good. And then you, <coughs> if, if you don't mind, let me know. I'm, I'm off that then. I'd Roger like to walk that. and see. Okay. And then um, maybe for the next meeting also, um, if there could be maybe something brought forward related to a housing needs assessment. I uh, will do my best. Yeah, I mean, that she, it seems like it's something I mean, that Denise could. Yeah, I was going to say, could Denise do that while you're still recovering? And then that, uh, what I it, will <coughs> like work with that as well. Yeah, Mary And if, if Emily, that, whatever it is that Emily, the report Emily put together, that that be resurrected as part mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, any other comments or questions? Um, I would like to thank Ken very much. Oh, yes. yes. His help thank with you. this. Um, and uh, I, I'd helpful. like to note that um, they did this under our membership uh, at no additional charge to the village. And our membership <laughs> under Green County Regional Planning. Wow. And <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. Um, Council retreat agenda discussion. Um, I provided a draft of some things, some thoughts that I had put together. Um, I think it was a combination of some things that Judith had mentioned before and just um, some of the things we had talked about in the past. Um, I know that we, we talked a lot about trying to refine our goals timeline, so I gave a lot of time to that, um, maybe more time than we need. Um, project management relates to how we how we relate to staff and commissions basically how we manage projects and our goals with staff and commissions I so. actually thought that the times looked good except probably we don't need an hour 
for status of leadership training okay. and staff development. Um, I think we definitely need that time for the goals, though. Mm -hmm. Judith, I know you had a lot of thoughts. What? Um, um, well, one thing I had mentioned, and you had suggested it could be lunchtime, was uh, I, I know there was just this meeting with the president of Antioch, but I was not able to attend. And I wondered, we, you talked about maybe inviting him to lunch. Does that make any sense? I, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to invite the president of Antioch to Antioch University Midwest if we're not inviting Antioch University Midwest. I mean, I, I can see. Well, there is no one at Midwest now. Well, and yeah, there's, there's well, tech, you know. the chancellor. Yeah. yeah. Well, at um, some point, it would be good for the village council to have a conversation with the president. Yeah, I've invited, him. Like I've invited him to meetings. I've invited him uh -huh. to come to council meetings. Maybe. Okay. Um, so, and one other thing um, that I'm wondering if we want to add, um, the council actually hasn't had an opportunity to have an executive session I'm thinking maybe we should maybe at the end of the day maybe that we can rearrange and at the end of the day that three o'clock to four o'clock session can actually be an executive session um, for personnel issues yeah I think that's good um, I had talked maybe about having some time for how we hire consultants Oh, that's yes. right, yeah. Um, I actually have that as part of my report. I've come up with a little process that I'll... Tonight? Uh, no, no. Uh, for the retreat. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is that under project management? It can Maybe. be, if you will. Yeah, like that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. What is a consultant? And uh, something I've been wondering about is um, just the shape of our budget. Um, you know, we've had some unexpected expenses. Mm -hmm. Um, and that last, uh, the last uh, legislation we had to do relative to the budget, I think we had to add another 300,000. I don't, some of that we're getting back, if that's how you call it. Or, I guess, well, anyway, 200,000 was the uh, green space monies, I guess. So, but uh, still, I just, um, the whole affordability question and that we be able to be working with our means, I think it's important. So I don't know if, the, if we need to talk about that at the retreat, but. Is is um, Melissa going to be able to be at the retreat? I believe she is. Yes, I will double check that with her, okay. but I believe she is. Mm -hmm. Maybe just to get a report of where things are mm -hmm. would be good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why don't I take some of these things and and we still have one more meeting and I'll bring a revised one to the next meeting. Um, I, I can I'll actually send it by send it to everybody sooner um, so we'll do that okay um, next is an update in the US Bank um, letter that was sent Patty um, yes uh, I have an update on the um, from the credit union uh, unfortunately they cannot provide us with all of the services that we require to for our banking um, they don't do lockbox and things like that um, and while they would love to help us they don't see that they are going to be able to add some of those things in in the near future um, so essentially um, the only choice that we would have is to split um, our accounts between the credit union and another financial institution which makes no sense to Rachel, Melissa, or myself because it just makes it more difficult for us to do our banking and, and splits and start splitting the fees that the, that the financial institution is going to get which gives you less of a you know, deal. So if council is of a mind to, to switch banks financial institutions we can certainly do that and put out an RFP but again um, it's going to be difficult to find a, a financial institution that does not uh, invest into some cause or um, project that we we as a village um, are opposed to so um, can it be done yes we can do it it's just it, it, we may not be able to find that institution but well, speaking I, specifically of this issue i think i don't think we're going to be able to find a financial institution that doesn't invest in 
right. some sort of mining, some sort of fracking, right. some sort of pipeline installation. I, I, I just think that they're either going to be financing it or they're going to have customers who are doing that work. And that's essentially the situation with, the Dakota, with U.S. Bank and Dakota Access. They're not financing the pipeline. They just have that one of the companies as a customer. Um, I know the YS Foundation wasn't, aren't they trying to look at this whole question? But for a very small portion of their, of their investment portfolio, because they recognize that they can't just, it, it's not fiscally responsible for them. Um, they won't get the return if, if they limit their investments too well, much. They, I mean, they're they won't in a get return. situation than we're in. They, they, right. I mean, they, they, they have to get retur a, a high return on their investments. That's I, I, I think it, I would like us to put out an RFP and in, in the RFP ask what, what is the money that's invested in the bank going to? I mean, we have West Banco and we have Huntington Bank. Now, they're both regional banks, and we already have money in Huntington. We, we have our investments, our long-term investments in Huntington, the, the money that we just invested into those tiered accounts that come mature every six months. That's the only money we have in Huntington. Everything else is in the I, I mean, I don't doubt that the banks, they don't have the kind of socially responsible criteria. Well, PNC maybe does, but I mean, <laughs> Unless we start doing things like this, um, nothing's going to change. So at least I think it would be worth writing an RFP and saying this is this is a concern that we have, and we want to know what where you have money invested. And, and do we consider a local bank that is providing local jobs and paying local tax dollars, owns property, paying local property tax and paying local income tax? Is, is that a consideration? Well, another consideration is the fact that um, I've seen Melissa standing in the U.S. Bank, and I bet, I mean, she probably walked down there or, or she drove yes. two blocks. You know, she didn't she drive 10 mm -hmm. blocks or, or 10 miles or right. where, you know. So, yeah, it's a complicated question. I mean, I, I, I think as a community, it's useful, it's important that we're talking about this. I mean, every community members should be thinking about where their investments are in their retirement, uh, you know, their retirement monies. Um, it's the same issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe we've got more money th as a, than an individual does, but it is the same issue. And so I think it's complicated. Um, you know, if, uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I mean, maybe we could do an RFP see what see what we get are there socially responsible portfolios i don't know well maybe we don't even have maybe we don't have to do an rfp to find out where the other banks have their I, mean, money. I mean the I, people who are I asking think. us to divest i mean we could ask them yeah to do the legwork to tell us you know well, is there is, we, is, we know that west bank is located in west virginia right and we know what happens in West Virginia. So I yeah. think we I know think where their yeah, I think, yeah. investments are. And I think that you have to remember, and Judith, I appreciate you bringing this up, is the staff time involved in, in the daily banking, because it is daily. Yeah. Um, so I, it's not that I disagree with being socially responsible, yeah. not at all. Yeah. But um, there are a lot of considerations. If council would like us to contact various institutions and ask if they can tell us some of their largest customers or primary, they may not tell us largest customers. They may protect the confidentiality of their customers. As I just say. I wonder if there are. I mean, there's people out there, you know, movement people who are thinking about socially responsible investment. And I'm just wondering how they're doing it. Well, and if we could learn something by right. those, to me, that's the place to look, not just maybe to go to Huntington well, or what's And actually, or they have, you know, I know they have, um, you know, organizations that evaluate nonprofits for how they perform, you know, and in terms of how much of their money is, you know, goes back into projects versus staff. I haven't found it yet, but I've tried to find 
I think there's got to be something out there mm -hmm. that probably already, you know, I mean, it's public information right. that pulls this. I mean, and I just think that there's all kinds of, you know, then, then there's all kinds of criteria we look at. How far do they have to, how far is Melissa going to have to yeah. drive? You know, what does that do to the environment? You know, and, and there's a safety factor of, mm -hmm. of staff mm -hmm. being with money, you know, outside of the village. And, you know, so I think that, that, um, well, I just wonder who we should sort of task. I don't know that it necessarily should be Patty. I mean, well, I don't think. I think right now our finance staff. I mean, p potentially Rachel. Is that something we could ask Rachel to start? Yeah. And and I agree with you. I mean, we had how many letters did we get? And right. MJ um, Gentile. I mean, those folks are you know are I mean, obviously I'm very passionate. I'm happy to contact all of those people. Where they put their money? And <laughs> and express our dilemma and mm -hmm. ask. For their what are they do? Yeah. yeah, I'm guessing a lot of them probably went to the went to the credit union, which yeah. is yeah. yeah. Sounds like it's not going to work for us, and and I actually I did talk to the manager at, at U.S. Bank, and and I don't know if she personally I think at least regionally they're working on a response, so we will be getting a response from them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so we already talked about Enan, Sand, and Gravel. We're moving on to the manager's report. Okay, let me find that. All right. Um, okay, we obviously talked about the glass farm report already. Um, the electric car chargers, um, as I emailed council uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, we did have to erect signs uh, that there was a four-hour maximum use period and no overnight use um, due to uh, a problem with some folks continually parking there overnight. So it's, you know, they're there for everyone to use and it's difficult to, to for a lot of people to use them um, when, yeah. when people are parked there consistently. Um, we are, uh, as, as council were members last summer, as, as part of our commitment to get away from uh, chemicals and be, go to more organic nutrients for our um, our green space and our properties, um, we um, we are dealing with beyond pesticides. They came in, did some soil test plots. We got the report back. It is now time to start a test plot with the um, with the findings in their report using some of these organic nutrients. Um, the village has set aside a portion of the. Um, the, the field in the northeast corner of, of Gaunt Park down there, I, I think it's where they play ultimate frisbee. Um, Jason marked that off today, so it is there for folks to see. Um, we will be using um, some organic compounds down there that are perfectly safe for children, pets, adults. Uh, for instance, one of them is dried molasses. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that uh, are what we will be using. Um, Nadia Malarkey, who is on the Environmental Commission and is kind of heading up this particular effort, will be writing an article uh, or a letter to the editor for the paper and talking to Diane about a potential article to get that information out. We'll be posting it on our website and on our Facebook page. But um, please understand this is perfectly safe. Um, the, com the compounds that we're using are, are perfectly safe and will not cause any harm. So we just want to get that message out there before we start so that people are a little more comfortable with that. Um, we talked about the street paving. Uh, we do have a request uh, for annexation from Trish Gustafson. She owns a 1.71 acre parcel on King Street that is not annexed into the village. However, what is unique about this parcel and the one next to it is that they are completely surrounded by village property. Um, uh, not village owned property, but property that is in the village. And if you look at the uh, attachment there, um, you can see um, that she, can you, yeah, move that up a little bit. She, her parcel is there outlined in red. Um, and you can see High Street, Fairfield, King Street, there it's completely surrounded. So she does have access to this property with the second parcel in there um, on High Street. Uh, she also owns that. She wants to develop this property, build a house on it, um, and so she would like to annex it in. 
Um, she will be coming to the next council meeting to make a formal petition to council, but I know we don't normally allow annexation outside our borders, but yes. this is within our borders Absolutely. and it's an island and it only benefits us to clear this island up. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is um, the pink is the pink that she's sort of in is that um that's the actual village limit up there by the cemetery is no, that No, I don't mean that. I mean she's there's like that rectangle and then she's in a, her red part. Yeah. See, that, the pink is, is outside that, the, uh, that's another parcel that's outside the village. Okay. Who that's else? Dan Dixon. That's, Dan Dixon. that's okay. Joe Nickerson's yeah. old property. Nickerson. Yeah. Property. That should have been annexed. Yeah. So a lot that, of years ago. that's why it's surrounded with that little pink border. Is that Pleasant Street that? Uh, yes, the dead end of that oh, Pleasant Street. Street. Yeah. So, so where is she accessing? She, she, you said it's on King Street, but she's not really going to come off King Street. Is she? I'm sorry, it's North Pleasant. High Street. I apologize, High Street. This okay. is her access right here. Okay. The second parcel off of um, North oh. High Street there, um, and I don't know if you can see it. Brian, can you point oh, on the other one to this one? Do you see it? This is hers. Yeah, that's her parcel. Wow. Oh, okay, yeah. so yeah. she owns that one, and that will be her <laughs> access back to the lot. Mm -hmm. So it's really convoluted, but oh, that's, <laughs> that part is in the village. That part is crazy. in the village. Yes. Yeah. So. So I don't. I mean, I, what what needs what needs to happen on this? I I don't know that she needs to come and plead her case. Council, are we? Well, she has to present a petition to council. Oh, she, Oh, really? To council? Okay. Okay. Well, so she, she, yeah, she can bring it, and I can present it, or, but I think she wants to do it herself. Okay. Well, that's good. It's, I just didn't want to add another step that didn't have to happen. No, no. So that if that has to happen, then she has to formally petition us. Then invite her. Yes. Um, two can other. We, can we approve it at that time? Yeah. Uh, she has to go through the county. And yeah, it has to go all through the county and the whole procedure. Okay. The county has to have. You know, no, so I mean, but does she need our approval we, to proceed? That's, we will have to uh, pass, I believe, or a resolution saying we'll provide services. And is there another one, or is that the only one first? Jane? That's the only. That starts it. Then you have another one coming down the road. But okay. yeah, you could so, potentially propose. Prepare that resolution ahead of time. If you yeah, want to if, save time. It's if council yeah. would like, we can put that resolution yeah. on the agenda. I would say, yeah, do whatever you can to okay. move that along. And um, uh, just with the caveat that, remember, I'm next Monday having my surgery, and I'm off all week. I have to be off all week. Yeah. So I will do my best to get that done. If Judy can shoot me a, a sample tomorrow, and I'll type it up and try to get it back to her. <coughs> um, two other things. Um, Johnny, Jason, and I will be meeting to discuss uh, right-of-ways and alleys and clearing brush and stuff out of them. Even if we don't move ahead with the fiber, which that's still up for discussion, but we're having access problems. And this is going to be a long and drawn-out process because if we try to do it all at once, it's just not financially feasible. But we, what we're going to have to do is probably prioritize, and I just want folks to be aware that we're going to have to start doing this. I, they had a fuse that popped out the other night, and they, it took them 20 minutes to wind through some bamboo and get back to it and try to just to pop a fuse back in. So, um, is the village going to do it, or are we asking the? Uh, that is part of the discussion, but um, normally we ask people to maintain their own right of way and easements, but folks are a little bit loath to do that sometimes. So it, we may have to come up with an alternative plan and bring it to council about how to approach this because it's just not working the way that we're trying to do it. So you know we have to have access to some of these utilities at least close enough to get a bucket truck so we can reach up over something. Mm -hmm. I mean some of this we can't even get close to. So um, and Brian, you asked me to clarify something about. Disconnect. Well, in particular, that yeah, that claim of what was it, 200 disconnects a month or we, something? We okay, uh, yes, I had gotten an email requesting some information, and do we send out about 200 notices every month about disconnect? Yes. Do we disconnect that many people? No. We disconnect between 20 and 30 people. A lot of people use the disconnect notices as a reminder that it is time to pay their bill or they get it and it's, they're waiting on payday and they pay it before the disconnects. So do those go out? Yes, they go out. Um, but we do not disconnect 200 people a month. 
And did you say also in that email that the disconnect rate is lower than it was before? Yes. The disconnect rate is lower than it was. When I first got here, we were actually shutting off uh, quite a few more people than we used to. When was that? Uh, 2013? I got here in no, July of 2014, 2014 was when I got here. And um, Melissa has worked with that and revamped the, the procedures and how people can get extensions and plans and things and is able to get that down and work with folks. So. And then I wanted to ask one more question about um, that the 25000 from Green County Parks and Trails. Did that come to the village? That came to the village at like the last, the, the, the 13th hour um, on the night of the auction. Okay. And it came to the village as a donation for our green space fund. So and have we sent a formal thank you for yes, that? Yes, we have. Okay. Um, and the last thing I would like to ask is, um, we commissions and boards are starting to have a lot of events and a lot of times commissions and boards don't think about getting event forms and agreements filled out because you're a part of the village but it really helps us as a staff if you get those filled out ahead of time um, because we review those at staff meetings and make sure everybody's on the same page and everything is logistically set and if we don't get them to, until the last minute that tends to create a problem um, you know, we have an event coming up here this weekend that we still don't have a form for. So, um, you know, we know it's coming and we're working with them to make that happen, but it, we still don't have a form. So what event is that? That would be the skate park. Which, that's not commission driven. Uh, it's so, not anymore. I mean, we never heard anything about that. So okay. it never came up at an Arts and Culture Commission meeting. Okay. And I just realized, I mean, the train station, I mean, we should probably have something for the opening date for trails. Mm -hmm. Well, I, this one's on village property okay. is the but problem. But so is, well, that's the train, train station. Yeah. So if, if we could just make a practice of that, um, you know, whenever the boards or commissions are wanting to do something, it would be nice for the staff to know, logistically at least, what we need to provide. And it's easiest to do that in written form. And we're happy to send it somebody an email that has that form attached. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything I didn't notice? Did Melissa have anything to report? She did, she did not. Okay. Um, report. Um, that the baby is doing great. I thank God. Is that a picture? Um, yeah. I'll oh, take one the next so time she comes. Yeah. She she was been in a couple of times Aww. with her. And, you know, Holly, <laughs> she's like she's over? like this big. Oh, she's a picture on the Facebook page. Yeah, she's like well, yeah. She is like this big. I mean, she's yeah. adorable. Oh. She's Chief? I should be able to get through this in 20 or 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, police Department is scheduling our first implicit bias training okay. seminar. Bias recognition diversity specialist, Mr. King Tony, TonyPolicingConsulting.com. In joining the uh, Ohio Collaborative, we have found that we lack some policy and implicit bias, and this is the next step uh, for educating officers. And in that, we're uh, sending two offers to be uh, officers to be CIT trained the third week of April. That will be Sergeant Watson and myself. The remaining officer will be attending CIT training in September. Can, Brian, can I ask you on the on the implicit bias? Is is everybody doing that, or is that just uh, everybody. everybody? Okay. Mm -hmm. And he's coming all, here? He, yes. Okay. All officers. We're uh, working out logistics now, but I believe he and possibly his wife will be staying at the hotel and uh, spending the evening here, and then we'll do a half-day seminar with him. Great. You know, if there are some materials that could be uh, given to the public, it, Absolutely. it would be nice for us to see what that is. Yeah. Um, Y'all Springs is ranked the lowest in the county regarding seatbelt usage among teenage and parent drivers in 2016. Y'all Springs has the opportunity to change this standing during the month of April when the Green County Safe Communities Coalition will be conducting their annual spring break seatbelt challenge to raise awareness about seatbelt use and encourage students to buckle up every trip, every time. The PD is now working with Ohio Department of Public Safety to try and remind us of the importance of seatbelt usage, even when we're home in the village. We have installed uh, two buckle-up signs that they provided us at the exit of the high school, and we hope to bring our stats up in 2017. Do, how do they get those stats? They have people who actually come 
and stay at the entrance and exits of the schools and do a count. Really? Um, so that's not only students, but it's parents as well. Uh -huh. We do it at Mills Lawn as well. Mm -hmm. So do you, do, I, I forget, are you allowed to pull over for seatbelt only? It's a secondary offense. Okay. Um, not a primary, but do you off, do the officers cite for seatbelt very often? Not too often. In fact, I can't remember the last time that that was actually on a citation. Well, maybe it should at least go on a citation without if there's not a financial. We can give a warning penalty or something. We can give yeah. a warning instead yeah. of. Yeah, we do have. We will see those on warnings more frequently, but I think part of the problem is just you know. It, so the community is small. We we think we leave our home and we go four blocks, but the majority of accidents happen within that four block I've been doing it lately. I'm still continuing uh, seeking student volunteers now who'd be interested in walking with officers to share experiences of life in Yellow Springs. Um, we have uh, compiled a short list now of adult volunteers, and around the third week of April we'll be meeting to kind of put our plan together as the weather gets nicer, so we'd like to talk to some students as well. Are you working with Kevin Leidy's students? Uh, yes. So that request has gone through them. And then the other thing is, um, I mean, I would imagine a lot of students would want to be involved, but also they, you know, have their community service hours at the high school? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then as you know, I think I mentioned last council meeting, April 19th, we were having lunch, as many officers as we can, at Antioch to eat in the cafeteria and then walk the campus with some of the students. So we're hoping that that maybe warms up a little bit and we'll get some more Antioch students involved. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Good work. Before, oh, question. Oh, sorry. No, just you, before you do your final thing, uh, I, I want to say something. Okay. Judy. Just that it's been busy and I'll be out on the 20th for an OMCA board meeting. Okay. Judy. Judith. So it works. Judy <laughs> works too. Uh, well, I just wanted to um, wish Patty the best on her oh, yes. surgery. Thank you. And I'll be uh, glad to not to be heal. in pain again. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So. so good luck and all Thank the best. You. Yes. We'll be thinking about you. Um, okay. No offense, but I won't be. I know. You'll be. You'll be. You'll, you'll be, be on vacation, home. right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So we have we have a lot of a lot of legislation. And I just want to understand what was decided on the two that I recused myself from. Are those going to be read again? Yeah, yeah we've got some work. Well, to do. I'm sorry, didn't interrupt you. No, go ahead. no, we're just going to have some work to do. And uh, finally, the, we're, we're done with it. Just needs to be waiting for council. And, Maybe, uh, I mean, I'd be happy to be part of. Uh, um, I mean, maybe since you've already been discussing it and you brought yeah. it, maybe Brian and I should work on that. Is that all right? Sure. Yeah. You're giving me a look of... No, no. <laughs> I, I was just... Actually, what was going on in my mind was just thinking about what I said about making sure citizens are aware that that is, you know, we're talking about it again. Yes, that's true. You know, and just yeah. how we make that really clear. And I do want to I do want to say that, that it was a... It was a pretty big shock to me. I mean, you know, we've been getting these we've been getting these text amendments and which are basically, you know, maybe a number or a word or something. This was a little bit more significant. And so I think we just need to make sure that that we're either getting planning commission minutes or something in our packet somehow that we're getting that that council and the community are being updated on these things coming to us. Mm -hmm. Um well, you know, something came up when I left the room to sit with Karen, um, and uh, she had a different viewpoint than I did about whether or not I should have said anything, at, um, you know, regarding that uh, issue. So I don't know if that's something we want to talk about at our retreat, but um, it came up as an issue anyway. What? If a council person, I mean, and citizen. actually in that regard, I I don't think I had a conflict of interest because I'm grandfathered in, and plus I, I'm, anyway, but if if a council person, if there's a perceived conflict of interest, 
there's the issue of can a council person speak to the issue at all? Mm -hmm. You can as a citizen, not as a council yeah. person. You can as a citizen, not as a council person. Okay. So I, since you're not voting, since yeah. you're not voting on it, you can. And, and that in 11 years had never been explained. Had never been. Yeah. I've never been told that in 11 years. Yeah. Um, I've always um, held to a different standard and felt that if I'm not going to take a vote, that to make my views known publicly pretty much um, undermined the whole the whole issue of conflict of interest. I, you know, that's that's not that's not to to judge Marianne and and uh, you know. But I, it's just it's just a standard that I've I've held for 11 years and will continue to hold it. Um, and and I and I also even when I've done that, I've taken heat from the community, from citizens accusing me of operating under a conflict of interest. So um, I guess maybe I'm particularly sensitive about it. Um, okay, so it looks like so then down on Ordinance 2017-08 we're actually going to be potentially back to a first reading of that um, if we can get something um, through on that. That resolution declaring April 27th Credit Scott King Day, um, it sounds like we added a resolution regarding annexation for the Gustafson property. Um, then we've got the 365 group bringing the police visioning statement. Um, ESC end of year CBE uses discussion summary. Then April 24th is our retreat. Um, May 1st, um, we'll have the, um, oh, I did mention that we do have the first reading of, um, do we have the first reading of the ordinance, the conservation easement on the glass farm? So we'll have the second reading of that. We'll have the second reading of the um, landscape ordinance. And then we've got design nine. Um, and then we'll, we've also added potentially for the, for the April um, 17th meeting or the May 1st, we've got housing needs assessment discussion. Discussion. And when? Then what was the other one? I, I, at the next meeting. At the next or the one after, whenever. And then wasn't there one other issue around Glass Farm that we talked about coming back? No, well, it was just the concert. No, it was just the conservation easement. Yeah, the housing needs assessment. If if we wanted to look at Emily's piece and just uh, you know look at, it seems like that could be useful. So we'll so we'll put something related to the housing needs assessment. Yeah. We'll put a discussion on the April seventeenth agenda. Yeah. So hopefully at that point, then maybe Marianne and Emily and the group can get together, and Denise can get together. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, and then I would like to keep May 1st a little bit um, light um, if we can because I think we'll probably have a broader discussion on design with Design 9. I think we should give them a little bit more time. And I'm not at that meeting. You're not? Oh, okay. Unfortunately. Yeah, that's not a good one for you to meet. Um, but I understand. Um, okay, a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you all.